Dr. Jung, uh, we have been discussing uh, in some detail some of the factors in the development of the personality of the individual, we, and you have very kindly uh, elaborated for us uh, on some of your fundamental concepts, such as the uh, archetype and at least simply what it means in certain types of archetypes, such as the anima and the animus, and we try to show, perhaps in our discussion, some of the ways that your ideas may have differed from those of Dr. Freud. Now, another uh, concept or idea that seems to be a very interesting one in your work, at least as I see it, is the term or concept persona. And, of course, uh, this seems to have a, a lot of relevance to the, to the daily living of the individual. I wonder if you would uh, mind telling us a little bit about how you uh, construe this term persona. Uh, well, this is a, a practical concept we need uh, in elucidating people's relation. Um, I noticed uh, with my uh, uh, patients, particularly with uh, people that are in, uh, in public life, that they have a certain way of uh, presenting themselves. Uh, for instance, take the doctor. He uh, has a, a certain way, for instance, he has good bedside manners, and, and uh, uh, he behaves as one as expects a doctor behaves. He may even identify himself with it and, uh, and believe that he is what he appears to be. Yeah. Uh, he must appear in, in a certain form, unless uh, people don't believe that he is a doctor. And so when he is a professor, he is also supposed to behave in a certain way, so that it is plausible that he is a professor. You know. So the persona is partially uh, the result of the demands society has. And on the other side, it is a, a, a compromise with what one likes to be, or with what, or as one likes to appear, uh -huh. say. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, take, for instance, uh, a parson. He also has his particular manner, and uh, as uh, corresponding to the general expectation, and uh, he behaves also in, uh, in another way, uh, combined with his per persona, that is, forced upon him by society I in such a way that also his fiction of himself, his idea about himself, uh, is more or less uh, portrayed or uh, represented. Uh, so the persona is a certain, certain complicated system of behavior which is partially dictated by society and partially dictated by the expectations of the wishes uh, one nurses oneself. Yes. Uh, now, this is not the real personality, in spite of the fact that people will assure you that it, that is all quite real and uh, quite honest, uh, yet it is not. Yes. Now, uh, such a uh, performance or, uh, say, yeah, the, the performance of the, uh, of the persona uh, is quite all right as long as you know that you are not identical with the way in which you appear. Yes. But uh, if you are unconscious of this fact, then you uh, get into uh, sometimes very disagreeable conflicts, namely people will uh, can't help noticing that at home, for instance, you are quite different from what you appear to be in public. Yeah. And people who don't know it uh, stumble over it in the end. Uh, they deny that they are like that, but they are like that. They yeah. are uh, it. And then you don't know, now, which is the real man? Yes. Yeah. Is he the man as he is at home or in intimate relations? Or is he uh, the man that appears in public? It is a question of Jekyll and Hyde. Yes. Often. Yeah. It is such, uh, uh, occasionally there is such a difference that you would almost be uh, able to speak of uh, the uh, double personality. Yes. And uh, the more that is pronounced, the more people, uh, people are neurotic. Yes. They get neurotic because they have two different ways. They are contradict themselves all the time 
and in as in much as they are unconscious of themselves, they don't know it. They think they're all one. Everybody sees that they are two. Yeah. And some know him only from one side, so others know him only from the other side. And then there are situations that clash, because the way you are creates certain situations in, with people in your relations, and uh, the, these two situations don't chime in. They, they are just uh, uh, dissonances. Yes, yes. And, uh, and the more that is the case, the more the people are neurotic. Actually, would you say that the individual may even have more than two personas? In other words, would he, could he possibly... Uh oh, rarely. You know, rarely. we can't afford uh, it uh, very well to play more than two roles. But there are. There are cases, for instance, where people have up to five different personalities. Yeah. In cases of, of dissociation of personality, where, for instance, the one person, say, call it person A, doesn't know of the existence of the person B, but B knows of A. Yes. Th or there may be a third personality, C, that doesn't know of the two others. Yes. You see, there are uh, such cases in literature. Yes. They are, th but rare. they are rare. Very the rare. The ordinary case is, is just an ordinary uh, dissociation of a personality. Yes. Uh, one calls that a systematic dissociation yes. in contradistinction to the chaotic or uh, unsystematic dissociation you find in schizophrenia. Yes. Now, uh, you distinguish between uh, the term persona, the term persona and the term ego. In other words, as you see them, they're two different things. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Now, uh, what is the difference between the term ego as you see it and the term well, persona? Well, you see, the, the ego is supposed to, to be the representative of the real person. Oh, but really? as I say, for instance, in the case where B knows of A, but A doesn't know of B, yes. in that case, one would say the ego is more on the side of C. Yes. Because the ego has a more complete knowledge, and yes. A is a, uh, a split of personality. Yes. Now, you also use the term self. Yes. Now, uh, the word self, then, uh, would this have a different meaning than, say, ego or Oh, yes. Oh, yes. quite. Oh, yes. You see? Uh, when I say self, then you mustn't think of I myself, because that is only your empirical self, and yes. that is covered by the term ego. ego. Yes. But when it is matter of the self, then it is matter of a personality that is more complete than the ego, because the ego is only consists of what you are conscious of. Yes, yes, your awareness. Uh, yeah, what you know to be yourself. Yes. Uh, for instance, in our example, B that knows A, and A doesn't know B, B is uh, relatively in the position of the self. Yes. Namely, uh, the self is on the one side the ego, on the other side the unconscious personality, which everybody pos uh, is in the possession of everybody, not in the possession, very often it is just the other way around, that the unconscious is in possession of consciousness. Yes, yes. Uh, but that is a, dif a different case. Now, uh, you see, while I am talking, I am conscious of what I say, yes. I am conscious of, of myself, yet only to a certain extent. Uh, quite a, a lot of things happen. Uh, for instance, I make gestures. I am not conscious of them. Yes to happen unconsciously. You can see them. Yes. Uh, I may say or use words, and I can't remember at all having used those words, or even at the moment I'm not conscious of them. Yes. So, uh, any amount of unconscious things occur in my conscious condition. I'm never wholly conscious of myself. Yes. Uh, while I'm trying, for instance, to uh, elaborate an argument, at the same time, there are unconscious processes that continue, perhaps a dream, which I have had the last night. Yes. Or uh, a part of myself thinks of God knows what. Yes. Or of a trip I'm going to take, or of uh, such and such people I have seen, or when I'm at, a, uh, say, a, at uh, writing a paper, I'm continuing writing that paper in my mind without knowing it. 
Yeah. <coughs> you can discover these things, uh, say, <coughs> in dreams, or if you are clever in uh, immediate uh, observation of an individual, then you see in the gestures or in the expression in the face that there is enough, uh, what one calls, in arrière pensée, yeah. something behind consciousness. Yes. So that you, you have finally the feeling, uh, well, that man has something up his sleeve. Yeah. And you can even ask him now, what, you are, what are you really thinking of? You're thinking all the time something else, yet he's not conscious of it. Or he may be. Uh, there are, of course, great individual uh, differences. There are individuals who have amazing knowledge of themselves, of the things that go on in themselves. But even those people wouldn't be uh, capable of knowing what is going on in their own cultures. Yes. For instance, they are not conscious of the fact that while they live a conscious life, all the time a myth is played in the unconscious. A myth that extends over centuries. Yes. Namely, uh, uh, archetypal ideas, a stream of archetypal ideas that goes on through one individual, through the centuries. Yes. You see, it, 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 it is uh, like a continuous stream, yes. and that comes then to the daylight in the great movements. Yes. Say, in, in political movements or in uh, spiritual movements. Um, uh, for instance, in the time before Reformation, uh, people dreamt of the great change. And that's the reason why uh, such great transformations could be predicted. Yes. Uh, if uh, somebody has been clever enough to see what is going on in people's mind, in the unconscious mind, yes. uh, uh, would be able to predict it. For yes. instance, I have predicted the Nazi rising in Germany uh, through the observation of my German patients. Yes. They had dreams in which the whole thing was anticipated. Uh, and, and with considerable detail. And I, I was uh, already absolutely certain in, 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 in the years before Hitler, before Hitler came in the beginning of the, well, I could, uh, could say the year, in the year 1919, I was sure that something was threatening in Germany, something very big and very catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And I only knew it through the, to the observation of the of of the of the unconscious. Of the unconscious. You see, there is something very particular in the different nations. And this is a, a peculiar fact that the archetype of the anima plays a, ve uh, a very great role in Western literature, French and Anglo-Saxon, yes. not in Germany. Yes. There are exceedingly few examples in German literature where the anima plays a role. Yes. You know, that simply comes from the fact that not woman, not one woman is buried uh, unless she is buried as alt kaminfeger Scotty, at least. Yes, yes. She must have a title, otherwise she, she hasn't existed. That's right, that's right. And so, you see, it is just as if, now mind you, this is a, a bit drastic, but it illustrates my point. Yes. Uh, in Germany, there are no women. There is Frau Doktor, Frau Professor, uh, uh, Frau Kommerzienrat, uh, the grandmother, the, the, the mother-in-law, the, the grandfather, father, the son, the daughter, the sister. No woman. Yes, yes, I see. I see. La femme. La femme. So next is the pop. <laughs> Doesn't exist. Well, uh, it is the idea, yes. you see. Now that is a, an, an enormous, uh, an enormous important fact, which shows that in the German mind there is going on a particular myth, uh, something very particular. Yes. And uh, uh, psychologists really should look out for these things. Yes. But they they prefer to think that I am a prophet. Yes. Ha! <laughs> Now, uh, just in the same context of journey, this is, of course, a very interesting and remarkable uh, set of statements here. Uh, how would you look at Hitler in this light? 
Uh, would you see him as a personification, a symbol of the father? Oh, no, 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 not at all. No, no, you see, I, I, I couldn't uh, possibly uh, explain that very complicated fact uh, or Hitler represents. It is, uh, it is too, too complicated, you know, he's a hero figure. Yeah. And the hero figure is far more important than any fathers that yeah. have ever existed. I see. Much broader than, much no, broader he than the media father No, he was not a father at all, not at all, he was a hero. Yeah. To, in, the, in, in the German myth. Yeah. And, mind you, a religious hero. He was a savior. Yeah. Yes. He was meant to be a savior, that is why they put uh, his photo on, upon the altars, yeah. even. Or uh, somebody declared all this too, so that he is uh, happy to, uh, that his eyes have beheld uh, 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 Hitler. Yeah. And now he can die in peace. <laughs> so he's just the hero myth, you know. Yeah. Now, uh, getting back to the idea of the self, and the self incorporates these unconscious uh, factors. The self incorporates these unconscious the factors. The self is merely a term that designates the whole personality, whole personality. because uh, the whole personality of man is indescribable. Yes. He, he, his consciousness can be described, his unconscious cannot Not be described, described because the unconscious, as I must repeat myself, yes. is always unconscious. Yes. And it is really unconscious, yes. but really does not know it. <laughs> does not know about it. And so we don't know our, uh, our unconscious personality. We have hints, we have... Uh, certain ideas, uh, but uh, we don't know it really. Nobody can say where man ends. And that is the, uh, the beauty of it, you know. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, the, the unconscious of man can reach God knows where. There we are going to make discoveries. Yeah. Now, another uh, uh, set of ideas, which of course are very, very well known to the world, but of course, you have originated, center around the, the terms introversion and extroversion. Yeah. And I know that uh, you're aware of the fact that uh, these terms have now become so widely yeah. known yeah. that the man on the street is using these terms constantly in describing his wife or his friends and so on and so forth. It's become the most, probably the most uh, used psychological concept by the layman that we have. Oh, like the word complex. <laughs> I have invented it too. That yes, that's the right. Social association experiments. Yes, that's right. Uh, well, you see, this is simply practical because there are certain people who definitely are more uh, influenced by their surroundings than by their own uh, intentions. While other people, well, there are other people who are more influenced by the subjective factor. Now, you see, the subjective factor, that's very characteristic, was understood by Freud as a sort of pathological uh, auto-erotism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, this is a mistake. Uh, you know, we have, uh, the psyche has two conditions, two important conditions. The one is the envi environmental influence, yes. Yes. and the other is the given fact of the the, of the psyche as it is born. The psyche is no, by no means tabula rasa. We are a definite mixture and combination of genes. Yes. And they are there from the very first moment of our life. And they give a definite character, even to the little child. And that is a subjective factor looked at from the outside. Now, if you look at it from the inside, yes. then it is just so as if you would observe the world. Yes. When you observe the world, you see people, you see houses, you see the sky, uh, you see tangible objects. But when you observe yourself within, you see moving images. Yes. A world of images. Yes. Uh, generally known as fantasies. fantasies. Uh, yet these uh, fantasies are facts. You see, it is a fact that a man has such and such a fantasy. And it is such a tangible fact, for instance, that when a man has a certain fantasy, uh, another man may lose his life. Yes. Or uh, a bridge is built. Yeah. These houses were all fantasies. Yes. Everything you do here, yeah, all of the right. houses, everything was fantasy to begin with. And fantasy has a proper reality. It is, that is not to be forgotten. Fantasy is not nothing. 
It is, of course, not a tangible object, but it is a fact, nevertheless. It is, uh, uh, see, a form of energy, yeah. uh, despite the fact we can't measure it. Yes. I, it is a manifestation of something. Yes. And that is a reality that is just uh, uh, a reality as, for instance, the Peace Treaty of Versailles or something like that. Yeah. It is no more, you can't show it. Yes. But it, 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 it has been a fact. Yes. And, and so, uh, the, the psychical events are facts, are realities. And when you observe the stream of images within, uh, you observe an aspect of the world. Yes. Of the world within. Because the psyche, you know, if you understand it as a phenomenon that takes place in so-called living bodies, uh, then it is a quality of matter. As our bo body consists of matter, we discover that this matter has another aspect, namely a psychic aspect. Yes. Yeah. And so it is simply the world from within, seen yes. from within. Yes. It is just as if we were seeing in another into another aspect of matter. Yes. Uh, it is an idea that is not my invention, that the old Democritus already said, uh, uh, talked of the spiritus insertus uh, atomis, yes. namely the spirit that is inserted in atoms. Yes, yes. Uh, that means the psyche is a quality that appears in matter. Uh, doesn't matter whether we understand it or not, yes. but this is the conclusion we come to, yes. if we draw conclusions without prejudices. Yes. And so, you see, the man who is going by the external world, by the influences of the, of the external world, say, society or perceptions, uh, sense perceptions, thinks that he, he is more valid, you know, because this is valid, this is real. And the man who goes by the subjective fact, is not valid because subjective factor is nothing. Yeah. No, that man is just as well based because he is based, uh, bases himself upon uh, the world from within. Yeah. And so he is quite right even if he says, oh, this is nothing but my fantasy, you know. Yeah. And of course that is the introvert. And that's the introvert is always afraid of, of the external world he will tell you, when you ask him, he, he, he will be apologetic about it. Yes. He will say, of course, yes, I know, it's only my fantasies. And, uh, and he has always resentment. And as the world in general, particularly America, is extroverted like hell, <laughs> uh, the, the, the introvert has no place. Yeah. Yeah. He, 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 because he doesn't know that he beholds the world from within. Yeah. And that gives him dignity. And that gives him certainty, because it is nowadays particularly the, the world hangs on a thin thread. Yeah. And that is the psyche of man. Yeah. Assume that uh, certain fellows in Moscow lose their nerve or their common sense uh, for a bit. And uh, the whole world is in fire and, uh, and flames. Yes, yes. Okay. It is, nowadays we are not threatened by uh, elementary catastrophes. There is no such thing uh, as an age bomb. Yeah. That is all man's doing. Yes. We are the great danger. The psyche is the great danger. What if something goes wrong with the psyche? And <coughs> so you see, it is, it is demonstrated to us in our days what what the power of the psyche is of man. How important it is to know something about it, but we know nothing about it. No, nobody would uh, would give credit to the idea that uh, the psychical uh, uh, processes of the ordinary man have any importance, whatever. One thinks, oh, he has just what he has in his head, it is all from his surrounding, his thought, such and such a thing, belief, such and such a thing. 
And particularly if he's well housed and well fed, then he has no ideas at all. And that, that's the great mistake. Because he is just that as which he is born, and he is not born as Tabula Rasa, but, but as, as a reality. Yes. Yeah. Now, um, of course, uh, one of the um, very common, uh, I think, misconceptions of your work among some of the uh, writers in America has been that they have sort of uh, characterized your discussions of introversion and extroversion as suggesting that the world was made up of only two kinds of people, introverts on one yeah, hand and extroverts yeah. on the other. And I'm sure you've been aware of in many of our people looking at things this way. And uh, of course, would you like to comment about that? In other words, uh, would you perceive the world being made up of only people or extreme introverts, people that are extreme extroverts? Well, you know, Bismarck once said, uh, <laughs> God may protect me uh, against my friends. With my enemies, I can be la myself alone. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know how people are. They have a, they catch a word, and then everything is schematized along that, that word. There is no such thing as a pure extrovert or a pure introvert. You know that. Such a man uh, would be in the lunatic asylum. This is, those are only terms to designate a certain penchant, a certain tendency. For instance, the tendency to be more influenced by environmental influences or more influenced by the, the subjective factor. That's all. Yes. And you see, there are uh, people who are very well balanced and are just as much influenced from within as they are from without, yes. or just as little. Yes. Uh, and so with all the the, the finer classifications, you know, yeah. they, they are only a, a sort of point de repère, points for orientation. Certainly then, uh, this whole matter of extremes, introversion, extroversion, it just, it, as, you, as you say, it's sort of a scheme, a schematic approach to sort of uh, hang an idea on uh, mm -hmm. an approach. Yeah. But it would be, as you say, ridiculous to say you that see, the whole, yes. my whole scheme of of typology is merely uh, a sort of orientation, uh, namely there is such a factor as introversion, there is such a factor as extroversion. The, the classification of individuals means nothing, nothing at all. It, this is only uh, uh, the instrumentarium yes. for the psychology, practical psychologists. Yes. Uh, to explain, for instance, a husband to a wife, or yeah. vice versa. For instance, uh, it is uh, very often the case, one could uh, almost say, it is almost a rule, but I don't want to make too many rules, you see, <laughs> in order not to be schematic, yeah. uh, that um, an introvert marries an extrovert for compensation, or another type marries the counter type to, to complement himself, for instance. Well, Dr. Jung, of course, uh, tied in with your typology and quotation marks of introversion and extroversion, uh, we, uh, of course, know of your concepts of thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition. And, of course, it would be very interesting to hear uh, uh, some expansion of the meaning of these particular terms as related to the introvert-extrovert dichotomy. Well, there is a quite a simple explanation of these uh, terms, and it, it shows at the same time how I arrived at uh, such a uh, uh, typology. Uh, namely, the sensation tells you that there is something. Thinking, roughly speaking, tells you uh, what it is. Feeling tells you whether it is agreeable or not to be accepted or not accepted or rejected. Yes. And intuition now there is a, a difficulty. Yes. You don't know ordinarily how intuition works. So when a man has a hunch, you can't tell exactly how he got at that hunch or where that hunch comes from. Uh, it is uh, something funny about intuition. Uh, I will tell you a little story. I yeah, had two do. patients. Uh, the 
uh, the man was a sensation type and the woman was an intuitive type. Of course, they felt attraction. <laughs> and so they took a little boat and went out to the lake of Zurich. And, uh, and there were those uh, birds that dive off the fish, you know. Yeah. And then after a certain time they come up again and you can't tell where they come up. And so they began to pit. Who the first was the first to, uh, to see the bird. Now, you would think that the one who observes reality very carefully, the sensation type, w would of course win out. Yes. Not at all. The woman won the bet completely. Yeah. She, she, beat, she uh, uh, was beating him on all points. Yeah. Uh, because by intuition she knew it before. I agree. See? <laughs> now, how is that possible? Yeah. Uh, well, sometimes, you know, you can really find out how uh, it works uh, by finding the intermediate links. You see, it is a, a perception uh, uh, by uh, intermediate links and you only get the result of that whole chain of yeah. associations. Yeah. Sometimes you succeed in finding out, yeah. but more often you don't. So my definition is intuition is a perception by m ways or means of the unconscious. Yes. That is as near as I can get. Uh, now this is a very important function because when you live under primitive conditions, a lot of unpredictable things are likely to happen. Yes. And there you need your intuition because you cannot possibly tell by your uh, um, perceptions, by your sense perceptions, what there is going to happen. For instance, you are traveling in primeval forest. You only see for a few steps ahead. Mm -hmm. You go by the compass perhaps, and you don't know what there is ahead. It is uncharted country. If you use your intuition, then you have hunches. And when you live under such primitive conditions, you instantly are aware of hunches. For instance, there are places that are favorable, there are places that are not favorable. You can't tell for your life what it is. Yeah. But you better follow these, these hunches. Yes. Uh, because anything can happen. You see, and, uh, quite unforeseen things. For instance, at the end of a, of a long day, you approach a river, and you don't know that there is a river. Yet, uh, when you are come to the river, uh, that is quite unexpected. F for miles there is no human habitation. You cannot swim across, it's all full of crocodiles. Uh, so what? You see? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, such an obstacle hasn't been foreseen. But it may be that you have had a hunch that you remained in, in the last likely spot and that you wait for the following day that you can build a raft or something yeah. of the sort yeah. or look out for possibilities. Um, you, uh, for instance, you also can have intuitions in, in uh, and it, that constantly happens in our jungle called a city. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can be, uh, have a hunch, something is going wrong, uh, particularly when you are driving a, uh, an automobile. Yeah. For instance, you, um, it is a day uh, where nurses appear in the street. Yeah. And, and they always try to, to, to get uh, um, something interesting like a suicide, you know, yeah. to be run over. That's what marvelous, apparently. Yeah. And, and then, you know, uh, you get a peculiar feeling and uh, really at the next corner all it is a second nurse that uh, runs in front of the automobile. Yeah. You see? Uh, duplicity of cases, you know, uh, yeah. it, that is uh, uh, a rule, you know, that uh, such chance happenings yeah. come in groups. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you see, we are constantly, we have constantly warnings, hints uh, that 
uh, or pa consists perhaps in a, in a slight feeling of uneasiness, uncertainty, fear. Uh, now, under primitive circumstances, you, you pay attention to these things. You, you, uh, they, they mean something. With us in our man-made, uh, absolutely, apparently safe conditions, we don't need that function so, so very much. Yes. Yet uh, we, we, we still use it. So you find them intuitive types, for instance, amongst bankers, Wall Street men. They follow hunches, you know, gamblers of all descriptions. Yes. Uh, you, you find the type very frequently among doctors because it helps them in their prognosis. Sometimes uh, a case can look quite uh, normal, as it were, and uh, you don't foresee any complications. Yet, an inner voice tells you, now look out here is something not quite all right, you know. Yes, yes. You, you cannot tell why and how, but we have a lot of subliminal perceptions, you yes, know, yes. Uh, sense perceptions. And from those, uh, we probably draw a good deal of our intuitions. But that is perception by the way of the unconscious. Yes. And you, ca you can observe that with intuitive types. You see, intuitive types very often do not perceive by their eyes or by their ears. They perceive by intuition. For instance, uh, once it happened that I had a a woman patient in the morning at nine o'clock. And uh, 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 you see, I often smoke my pipe and there is a certain smell of tobacco in, in the room or a cigar. And, and, uh, and so she, uh, she came and said, but you begin early, I said, Co do you call it early at nine o'clock? I said, no, you, you must have seen somebody at eight o'clock. Uh, I said, how do you know? There had been a man there uh, that uh, had come at 8 o'clock already. Uh, then she said, oh, well, I just a hunch. There must have been a gentleman with you this morning. I said, hmm. uh, uh, but uh, how do you know it was a gentleman? He said, oh, well, I just had the impression uh, the atmosphere uh, <laughs> was just like, yeah. like a gentleman here. Yeah. Yeah. All the time, you know, the ashtray was under her nose, and there wa was a, a yeah. half-smoked cigar. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yes. she wouldn't notice it. Yes. So you see, the intuitive is a type that doesn't see, doesn't see the stumbling block before his feet. Uh, but but he, he's had for, uh, for ten miles. Yes. Uh, you make a distinction between an intuitive extrovert yes. and an intuitive. Introvert, yes. yes. All these types can be yes, on the either, ex either, extrovert either or type. introverted line. For example, more specifically, what would be an uh, example or a difference between an, an intuitive extrovert and an, an intuitive introvert? Uh, well, you know, the <laughs> you have chosen <coughs> a, a somewhat difficult uh, case, you know, because the one of the most difficult types is the intuitive introvert, yes, you know. Uh, yes. Uh, the intuitive extrovert you find among hunters, bankers, yes, gamblers. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, that is quite understandable. Yes. But the introvert is, is uh, the introvert uh, variety is more difficult because he has intuitions as to the subjective factor, namely the inner world. Yes. And of course that is now very difficult to understand uh, because what he sees uh, are most uncommon things. And uh, he doesn't like to talk of them yes. if he's not a fool, because he, he, he would uh, spoil his own game by telling what he sees, because people won't understand it. Yes. Um, <coughs> for instance, once I, I had a patient, a young woman, about 20, 27 or 8, and her first words were when I had seated her, he said, you know, doctor, I come to you because I have a, a, a snake in my abdomen. Hmm. I said, what? <laughs> he said, uh, yes, a snake, uh, a black snake, 
coiled up right in the, in, 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 in the bottom of my abdomen. And I must have made a rather uh, bewildered uh, face at her. And she said, you know, uh, I, I, I don't mean it literally, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I should say it was a snake. It was a snake. <laughs> see? Now, you see, our further conversation a little later was that she said, uh, that was about in the middle of our treatment, that only lasted for 10 consultations. She, she had foretold me, I come 10 times, and then it's all right. <laughs> I said, how do you know? Oh, I got a hunch, you see. Yeah. And, and really, uh, about the fifth or sixth hour, she said, Doctor, I must tell you, uh, the, the snake has risen. It is now about here. <laughs> uh, hunch. And then, in, in, uh, on the tenth day, I said, now, this is our last hour. And do you feel cured? And she said, beaming, she said, you know, this morning, it came up <laughs> and came out of my mouth and the head was golden. Mm. And that, those were her last words. Mm. Now, you see, that same girl, when it, came, came, when it comes to reality, she came to me because she couldn't hear the step of her, of her, uh, of her feet anymore. Yeah. Because she walked on air, yeah. literally. Yeah. She couldn't hear it, and that, that frightened her. And when she came to me, I asked for her, her address. And then she said, oh, pension so-and-so. Uh, well, it is not just called, called pension, but it is a sort of pension. And it is, uh, I never had heard of it. Yeah. And uh, I said, no, I'm curious, I never have heard of that place. Well, it's a very nice place, she said. Uh, Curious enough, there are only young girls there, very nice and very lively young girls, and they have a merry time. I often wish they would invite me to their uh, merry evenings. And uh, I said, but uh, uh, they amuse themselves all uh, alone. I said, oh no, there are plenty of young gentlemen coming in, and uh, they have a, a beautiful time, but they never invite me. It turned out that it was a private brother. Yes. <laughs> and she was a perfectly decent yeah. girl, you know, of a very good family. Not from here. She, yeah. she, she, she had found that place, I uh, don't know how. And, and she was utterly unaware that they also were all prostitutes. <laughs> I said, for heaven's sake, you, you fell in the, uh, 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 into, uh, into a very dark place. You, you, you hasten to get out of it. Uh, you see, that is what her sensation, yeah. you see, she yeah. doesn't see, didn't see reality, yeah. Yeah. but she had hunches like anything, and they yeah. came off. Yeah. Now, you see, such a person cannot possibly speak of, uh, of her experiences, yes. because everybody would think she's absolutely crazy. Yeah. I myself was, was quite shocked when I thought, for heaven's sake, is that case a, a schizophrenia? Yeah. Because uh, you don't hear that kind of speech. Right. But she assumed that the old man, of course, knows everything. And he even does under uh, understands such kind of language. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you see, if, uh, when, w or when the in intuitive, uh, um, uh, the uh, introverted intuitive yes. uh, would speak what he really perceives, then practically nobody would understand it. He would be misunderstood. And so they learn to keep things to themselves. And you hardly ever hear them talking of these things. That is a great disadvantage. But it is an enormous advantage in another way. Uh, not to speak of the uh, experience they got in that uh, respect, but also in human relations. For instance, they come into the presence of somebody they don't know. And certainly they have inner images. And those inner images give them a more or less complete information about the psychology of the partner. Yeah. yeah. You know, that is, uh, but it of case can also happen that they come into, pre into the presence of somebody who they don't know at all, not from Adam. And they know an important piece out of the biography of that person. Yes, 
Yes. And are not the world of it. And tell the story. Yes. Uh, and then the fat is in the fire. Yeah, that's right. You see? So the, the introverted, intuitive is, is, uh, has a, in a way a very difficult life, although one of the most interesting lives. Yes. But it is difficult often to get into the confidence. Yes, you know. yes because if you say they're afraid but that people will think that they're, they're sick. The, the, the things they in that, yeah. that are interesting to them or are vital to them are utterly strange to the ordinary individual. Uh, uh, the psychologists should know of, of such things, yeah. you see. Yes. You see, when, when people make a psychology as a psychologist ought to do, well, I, I, the very first question, is he extroverted or is he introverted? Yes. He will look at entirely different things. Yes. Is he a sensation type? Is he an in, in, intuitive type? Is he thinking? Is he feeling? feeling. Yes. That, uh, because, you see, these things are complicated that they are, they are still more complicated because the introverted thinker, for instance, uh, is compensated by extroverted feeling, yeah. or by inferior extroverted, archaic extroverted feeling. Yes. So an introverted thinker may be very crude in his uh, feeling life, for instance, the introverted uh, philosopher. Um, that is always carefully avoiding women, will be married by his cook in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, uh, then, in, in other words, then we can take your introvert, extrovert categories and in a sense go through uh, describing a sensation introvert type, sensation extrovert type, thinking introvert type, thinking extrovert type, and so on. In each case, it, it stems from really not real categories, but simply, as you say, an approach, uh, something to uh, sort of uh, help us yes. uh, study, a model. Well, it is it's just a, a sort of uh, a skeleton, skeleton. Uh, to which you have to add the, the flesh, or uh, say you, it is uh, a country mapped out, you know, by triangulation points. And that doesn't mean the country consists of triangulation points. Yeah. That is only in order to, to have an idea of the distances. Yes. And, uh, and, and so it is uh, uh, a, a means to an end. It only makes sense, uh, uh, such a scheme, uh, when, when, you have, when you deal with practical cases. Of course, uh, you're familiar with the work of uh, Dr. J.B. Ryan at Duke University. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, of course, some of his um, work in extrasensory perception and clairvoyance, as he calls yes, it, yes. Um, mental telepathy, you know, yeah, and yeah, so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah. Um, some of the descriptions in his work sound quite a bit at times, like intuitive yeah, function yeah, yeah, sure, operating. Sure, sure, sure. And yeah, yeah. Uh, in terms of your knowledge of this work, would you say that uh, a person who has clairvoyance, yes. in a sense, would then be yeah. an intuitive type? A person mm. who, in his experiment, <coughs> is more likely to... <coughs> That's quite probable. Or um, uh, it can be um, a, a sensation type, uh, say an extrovert sensation type that is very much influenced by the unconscious. I see. Because he, he has introverted intuition in his unconscious. I see. I see. You see, there are two groups, you see, the rational group and the irrational group. The rational group is thinking and feeling. Because the ideal thinking is a rational result. That's right. Feeling also a rational result, rational values. Yes. That is differentiated feeling. Whereas sensation must needs be irrational because it may, it may not prejudice facts. Yes. You see? Yeah. It shall not prejudice uh, facts. Uh, the, the, the real uh, ideal perception is that you have an accurate perception of the things as they are, without addition or corrections. Yes. On the other side, the intuition uh, does not look at the things as they are. That is prison, that is another model to yes. the intuition. Yes. It looks, oh, ever so shortly at 
the things as they are and makes off into an unconscious process at the end of which we have seen something nobody else would have seen. Yes. You see. Now, so you see these uh, people who, who yield the best results are always those people were introverted uh, or uh, introverted uh, intuition comes in. Yeah. But uh, you see, that is uh, uh, a side aspect of it. It's not interesting. Yeah. Uh, the, there the question uh, uh, is another question far more interesting. Namely, the, that the terms they use, Rein himself uses them, yeah. recognition, telepathy, yes. etc. They mean nothing at all. There are words, but he thinks he has said something when he says telepathy. Yeah. That's nothing. In other words, the word itself is not a description of the process. It's That's what you think. Yes. It means nothing. It means nothing at all. Yes. Now, of course, uh, a lot of the things that you're describing, I think often uh, scientists will say, well, this is due to chance, chance occurrences, chance factors. And Ryan, yeah. in his own work, used statistical methods. We find this happening more often than would be expected by chance. Well, you see, he proves that it is more than chance. Yes. It is statistically graspable. Yes. And that is the important point. Yes. And that hasn't been contradicted. Yes. You see, there was a, such a poor sap who, uh, that, happened, uh, that happened in England. The man said, oh, Rhein, well, that's nothing but, but guesswork. <laughs> exactly. Yes. That is it. It is guessing. Yes. What you call guessing, a hunch is guessing. Yes. Uh, a bit of definite guess, of a g a definite guess, you know, uh, uh, is, a, uh, is a hunch, you know. Yes. Just that. Yes. But that means nothing. Yes. You see, the point is that it is more than than merely probable. Yes. It is no, It is. It is beyond chance. Yes. And that is the great problem. And but you know, people hate such problems. They can't deal with. They're not concrete, they're not uh, in front of them. Uh, they can't deal with it. Yeah. Even Rhein uh, doesn't understand my argument in that uh, uh, respect. Because it is a, a relativation. Now I'm going to say something which in, in these sacred rooms is anathema. <laughs> a a re relativation of time and space through the psyche. And that's the fact. And that is what Rhein has uh, uh, made evident. Yes. Now I'll swallow that. <laughs> well, that's, that's difficult. Yes. Well, may I, may I go a little further? And uh, of course, some of your recent work, uh, which is indeed very profound, and uh, it is not too well known to many of our students as of yet. Of course not. And of course, this Nobody is reads these things. <laughs> <laughs> Only the general public. <laughs> and <laughs> because I, my books are at least sold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm referring now to uh, the, the concept of synchronicity, which you have discussed, yeah. and uh, which would have some relevance at this point in our discussion. Uh, would you care to comment a little bit on, well, on this concept? That is, that is awfully com complicated. One wouldn't know where to, where to, to begin. Of course, it is uh, the, this kind of, uh, of thinking has been started. Uh, long ago, uh, uh, and uh, when Rhein uh, uh, brought out these results, uh, I, I thought now we have at least a, a more or less dependable basis uh, to argue on, you know. But the argument was not understood at all, uh, because it's, it's really very, very difficult. Um, uh, you know, there are plenty of facts. In, in, in the observation of the unconscious, where you come across uh, cases of a very peculiar kind uh, of parallel uh, events, namely that, say, I have a certain thought um, or a certain uh, definite uh, subject uh, is occupying my attention, yes. my interest. At the same time, something else, quite independently, happens 
that portrays just that uh, thought. Yes. Now, uh, this is utter nonsense, you know, from a, looked at from a causal point of view. That it is not nonsense is made evident by the results of, of Ryan's experiments. Uh, there is a probability, uh, it is something more than chance, that such a case occurs. Now I have, uh, um, I never made statistical experiments yes. to, uh, except one um, in, the, in the way of Ryan. Uh, I have made one for, for another purpose. Um, but I have come across quite a number of cases where it was most astounding to find that uh, two causal chains happened at the same time, but independent upon, uh, upon each other. So that you could say they have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. Of course, it's quite clear. For instance, uh, just so I speak of a, of a, of a red uh, car, and at that moment a, a red car comes here, you see. Yes. Now, I haven't seen it. It was impossible because it was behind the building. In this moment, the red car appears. Now, this is, uh, so you that's mere chance. The ex Ryan's experiment proves that these cases are not mere chances. Of course, uh, uh, many of these things are occurrences where we cannot apply such an argument, otherwise we would be superstitious. We can't say, now this car has appeared because here was, uh, some remarks have been made about the red car. Yes. It's not uh, cause and effect. Oh, this is yes. a miracle that yes. the red car appears. It is not, it is chance, yes. just chance. But these chances happen uh, more, uh, more often then chance allows. Yes. And that shows that there is something behind it. Yes. So you see, in, uh, uh, Rhein has a whole institute and with many yes. co-workers yes. and has the means, we have no means here, you know, and I had no means to make such uh, experiments, otherwise I probably would have done them. But uh, I, uh, this just was physically impossible. So I had to content myself with the observation of facts. I began uh, an examination of the human attitudes, namely um, uh, how our consciousness functions. Uh, I couldn't help seeing, for instance, the difference between Freud and Adler. Typical difference. The one assumes uh, that the things evolve along the line of the sex instinct. The other assumes that things evolve along the line of, of power drive. And there I was, I was in between the two, but I could see the justification of Freud's view. I could also see the same for Adler. And I knew that there are plenty of other ways in which things could be envisaged. And so I, uh, I I consider my scientific duty to examine first the, the condition of the human consciousness uh, that is the originator of ways of, uh, of envisaging. Of, uh, it is the factor that produces attitudes, conscious attitudes towards certain uh, phenomena. Uh, so when you know, for instance, that uh, uh, there are people who see the difference between red and green. Uh, you can take it for a fact that everybody sees that difference. Not at all. There are uh, cases of totalism and, and so on, you know. Uh, the, uh, the one sees this, the other sees that. And I try to find out what the principle the, the, the principal differences were. And that is the book about the types. And so first is introverted and extroverted attitude, then the functional aspects, 
namely which of the four functions is uh, predominant. Now, mind you, these, these four functions were not a scheme I had invented and applied to psychology. On the contrary, it took me quite a long time to discover that there is uh, another type, but the thinking type. Is I thought my type is 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 is, is of course that is that, that is human. It, it, it is not. There are other pe people who decide the same problems I have to decide in an entirely different way. They look at things in an entirely different way. They have entirely different values. They are, for instance, feeling types. And so, after a while, I discovered that there are. Uh, uh, intuitive types. Uh, they gave me much trouble. It took me over, over a year to become cl uh, somewhat clear about the, ex the existence of intuitive types. And the last and, and the most unexpected was the sensation type. Uh, and only later on I saw that those are naturally the four aspects of, of conscious uh, um, uh, uh, orientation. Uh, you can increase the number of principles, but uh, I found uh, the, the most simple way is the way I told you. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, as the uh, division by four is, uh, is a simple and natural division of a circle. I didn't know the symbolism of this uh, particular uh, classification. Uh, only when I studied the archetypes, I became aware that this is a, a very important archetype yes. that has a, a yes. an enormous role. Mm. I also found uh, in the study of the types that it gives us a certain lead as to the personal nature of the unconscious, the personal quality of the unconscious in a given case, but to take an extrovert. Well, his unconscious has then an introverted quality because all the extroverted qualities are played in consciousness and the, and, and the introvert is left with the unconscious, yes. therefore it has introverted qualities and so on with the functions the same. Yes. Uh, that gave me uh, a lead uh, of the diagnostic value. Mm. It, uh, it helped me to understand my patients. Well, Professor Jung, um, we have been discussing uh, many of the very fundamental ideas in, in your theories, such as anima and animus, and of course, uh, being representative of the whole idea of archetypes, as you explained it so interestingly. And we talked a little bit about this whole conception of the ego and the self and the persona as they are involved in all of this. And uh, as we speak, of course, it begins to uh, point to the direction of the sort of question that is so important as we try to understand the individual. And this centers around the problem of motivation, why the person does what he does. Now, to a great degree, you've already talked about this when you talked about archetypes and, and this, this whole matter. Now, in the work of uh, Dr. Freud, he spoke of libido as an energy. And earlier, we spoke of libido and the fact that you felt that it was more than just sexual energy. He felt that it could be something much broader. Now, you have certain uh, principles about psychic energy, which uh, are indeed very provocative. Now, one of this principle is, I believe, you refer to as the principle of entropy. Entropy. Well, you know, only uh, I allude to it. Yes, uh, yes. The main point is, you know, the, uh, the standpoint of energetics uh, yes. uh, as applied <coughs> to <coughs> pheno psychic phenomena, psychical phenomena. Uh, there uh, you uh, have no uh, possibility to measure exactly. So it always remains a sort of anal an, an, an analogy. analogy. As Freud, Freud, for instance, uses the term libido uh, in the sense of a sexual energy. Yes. And uh, that, that is not quite correct. You see, if it is sexual, then it is a power. Yes. like electricity yes. or uh, any other form of manifestation of energy. Yes. Now, 
energy is a, a concept. Yes. Uh, energy is a concept by which you try to uh, express the analogies of all power manifestations. I see. Namely, that they have a certain quantity, a certain intensity, and uh, that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, a flow in one direction, namely uh, uh, to the uh, ultimate uh, suspension of the opposites, for instance. I see. Uh, low, high uh, uh, height, uh, a lake on a mountain yeah. flows down un until all the water is down, you know, and uh, then it is finished. Yes. And so, you see, something similar is the case in uh, psychology that, uh, you see from the factors, we get tired from uh, intellectual work yes. or from, uh, from, from consciously living and then we must sleep in order to restore our powers and it's just as said in, in the night as, uh, the, uh, as if the, uh, the water was pumped from the lower level to a higher level, you yes. know, so yes. that he can work again the next day. Yes. Uh, uh, of course, there, uh, that, uh, 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 that uh, simile is limping too. Yes. So it is only in an analogous way that we uh, use the term energy. Yes. And I used it because I wanted to express the fact that the power manifestation of sexuality is not the only power manifestation. I because see. you have another tribe, uh, uh, say, the, the tribe to, uh, to conquer or to, uh, to uh, the uh, drive to aggression or something of the sort. Yes. Or uh, there, are, there are many forms, you see, for instance, to take animals, the way they are building their nest, the urge of the, of the traveling bird, you know, that migrates. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, all they are driven by a, a, a sort of energy manifestation. I see. And, and, uh, you see, the, the, the meaning of the word sexuality w would, would be entirely gone if everything is that. Yes. So Freud himself saw that this is not applicable everywhere. And later on, he, he corrected himself by assuming that there are also uh, ego, ego drives. Drive. Ego drives, yes. You see, now that is something else. Yes. That's another manifestation. Now, in order not to presume or to prejudice things. I uh, speak simply of energy, I see. Uh, an energy. I it see. is a, a quantity of, of energy uh, that can manifest via sexuality or, or via any other instinct. Any other type of drive, yes. yes. And that is the main feature, uh, not the existence of one single power. I see. Because that is, is not wantable. Yes. Now, uh, another thing about uh, a motivation or you know, the condition which arouse and direct mm. and sustain the individual, uh, there uh, seems to be two uh, views that we find in much of our psychology uh, in America today. Now, one is, uh, might be called an historical view, where we try to look in the history and development of the individual yes. for answers to why he's doing certain things yes. at the moment. Yes. Yes. Then we have another view, which was uh, postulated and discussed by Dr. Kurt Levine, yeah. Dr. Kurt Lewin, which is sort of a field theory. He thinks that the history, the past, is not important motivation, but all conditions which um, uh, affect the individual at that moment. We yes. can predict behavior by knowing all the conditions of that yes. moment, but we don't have to go back to the past to yeah. understand uh, why the person does what he does. Now, would you, uh, you think that this present field idea of Dr. Lewin uh, has any virtue? Does it, does it make well, any sense? Uh, obviously, you see, I, I always insist that even a, a chronic neurosis has its true cause in the moment. In the moment. Now. Now. The, the neurosis is made every day by the wrong attitude the individual has. But that wrong attitude is a historical fact that needs to be explained historically yes. by things that have happened in the past. Yes. But that is one sided too because the, uh, you know, all psychological facts are uh, oriented um, not only to a cause but also to a, to a, 
a certain goal. A goal, yes. You see, they, they, are, they are in a way teleological. Yes. Namely, uh, they serve a certain purpose. Yes. And so, um, uh, uh, a wrong attitude can have originated in a certain way uh, long ago. Yes. But uh, it wouldn't exist today anymore if there were not immediate causes and immediate purposes that keep it alive today. Yes, yes, I see. So a neurosis can be finished suddenly, on a certain day, uh, despite of all causes. Yes. Because one has observed uh, in the beginning of the war, uh, the cases of compulsion neurosis that have lasted for many years, yes. suddenly were cured. Yes, yes. Because they got into an entirely new condition, it, it is like a shock. You see, you see that with shock, you see, uh, even the schizophrenia can be vastly improved by, by a shock. Yes. yes. Uh, because that's a new condition, uh, it, it is a very uh, shocking thing yes. that, uh, that shocks them out of their habitual attitude. And then there are no more in it, and, th and then the whole, the whole thing collapses, the whole uh, system that yes. has been built up for years. Yes. yes. So in therapy, in working with a patient, you would not say that it's absolutely imperative to have to more uh, reformulate all of his past life in order to help him with his present neurosis. You feel that you, you could deal with him at the, at the moment, with his problem as it is at this time, and it's not necessary to go back and probe into things that happened to him during his first, well, second, and third year of life. You see, there is no system about it in therapy. Yes. In therapy, you uh, you treat the patient as he is in the present moment, the present moment. Uh, irrespective of causes and, uh, and and such things. That is all more or less theoretical. Yes. Um, there are there are cases who know just as much about their own neurosis as I know about it. In a way. Yes. Uh, in, in such cases, I can start right away uh, with. Uh, posing the problem. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, there is a case, a professor of philosophy, and he imagines uh, that he has uh, cancer. Yes. He, he shows me uh, uh, several dozen uh, x-ray plates uh, that prove that there is no cancer. Yes. And he says, of course I have no cancer, but nevertheless I'm afraid I could have one. You see, I have consulted so many surgeons, and they all assure me there is none, and I know there is none, but I might have one, you see, <laughs> and that's enough. Yes. Now, uh, you see, such a case can stop from one moment to the other. Yes. He simply uh, stops thinking such a foolish thing, I you see. see. I see. But that is exactly what he cannot do. Yes. And in such a case, I say, well, it's perfectly plain to you. It it's, it's nonsense what you believe. But now, why are you forced to uh, believe such nonsense? What is the power that makes you think such a thing against your free will? You know it is nonsense, and why should you think it? Or what for should you think it? Yes, yes. Well, and what is that power that makes you think such a thing? It's like a, like a, a possession, you know? Yes. Exactly. It's yes. like a demon yes. in him yes. that makes him think like that, yes. in spite of the fact that he doesn't want it. Yes. See, then we have the problem. That is the problem for an intellectual man. And then I say, now, you see, you don't know. You have no answer. Yes. I have no answer. Yes. Now what are we going to do? Yes. I say, now we must see what you dream. Because the dream is the manifestation of the unconscious side. Uh. Now he never has heard of the unconscious side. So I must explain to him that he has an unconscious yes. and that the dream is a manifestation of it and if we, we succeed in analyzing the dream we, we, we might get an idea about that power that makes him think like that. I see. I see. You see? Uh, so uh, in, in such a case uh, one can begin right away with the analysis of dreams yes. and in all cases uh, th that are a bit serious Mind you, this is not a simple case, this is a very yes, serious yes. and difficult case, uh, in spite of the simplicity of the uh, phenomenology, of the symptomatology. Yes. In, in all cases, after uh, 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 the preliminaries, as it were, yes, uh, yes. 
history of the family, the, uh, the adverse medical anamnesis, etc. We come to that question. What is it in your unconscious that makes you wrong? Yeah. That hinders you to think normally? Yeah. And then we are uh, there where we can begin with the observation of the unconscious. And then, day by day, one goes on by the data the unconscious produces. Yeah. You see, we discuss the dream, and that gives a new surface to the whole problem. And uh, he, he will have another dream, and the, the next dream gives again an answer, because the unconscious is in a compensated relation to consciousness. And, uh, and after a while, we get the full picture. Yes. And if he has a full picture, and uh, has the, the necessary moral stamina, uh, well, then he, he can be cured. I see, I see. But in the end, it is a moral question whether a man applies what he had learned or, or not. Yes. So you see then, in a sense, in this situation, um, the, the unconscious plays a very important part. Uh, the unconscious which is found in the dream. But as you see it then, what you have found in the dream is not necessarily then a uh, image or symbol of what has happened in the past in his particular not life. At all. Not at all. It is just it's a symbol. Uh, of the symbol is not, uh, you see that is a special term. Uh, it is the manifestation of the situation of the unconscious, looked at from the unconscious. I see. You see, I tell you, for instance, something which is my personal or subjective view. Yes. And if I ask myself, how are you really quite convinced of it? Well, I must admit I have certain doubts. Yes. Uh, there are certain doubts. Not in the moment when I tell you, but these doubts are in the unconscious. And when you have a dream about it, these doubts come to the forefront in my dreams. Yes. And that is the way the unconscious looks at the thing. Yes, yes. It is just so as if the unconscious would say, oh yes, that's all very well what you are uh, 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 stating, but you omit entirely such and such a point. Yes, yes. Now, as the unconscious acts on this present situation, now looking at this thing in yeah. motivational, broad motivational terms, now this effect of the unconscious is not something which is the result of, of repression in the same way the, the uh, orthodox psychoanalysts had it all, then, as you no, say. No, it may be, you know, that what the unconscious has to say is so disagreeable that one prefers not to listen. Yes. And in, in most cases, uh, uh, people would be probably less neurotic if they could admit the, th the things. Because these things are, are always a bit difficult or, or yes. disagreeable or uh, inconvenient or something yes. of the sort. So there is always a certain amount of repression, but that is not the main thing. Not the the main, main thing is that they are really unconscious. Yes. And uh, you see, if you are unconscious in, in, in about certain things that ought to be conscious, then you are dissociated. I see. And then you are uh, a man whose uh, uh, left hand never knows what the right is doing. Yes. Uh, and counteracts or interferes with the right hand. Yes. Now such a man is hampered all over the place. Yes, yes. Now, looking at the unconscious in this way, of course this is a, as you say, it's unconscious, how can we know about it? Yeah. But trying to, just for that moment, just to, as an illustration, uh, would a particular individual, we might say who has been brought up in a, in a, in a culture such as the culture of India, yeah. a particular individual in yes. India, as we were to, if we could examine his unconscious, would it be, in, in, in many respects, say, similar to the unconscious of a particular individual who was, say, uh, lived in Switzerland mm. all his life? In other yes. words, you spoke earlier about yes. these universals. Yes. Would there be uh, uh, a great deal of uh, equivalence between the unconscious of a particular individual who has been mm. raised in one culture mm. and another individual who was raised in an entirely different culture? Yes. Well, you see, there, that question is also complicated because when we speak of the unconscious, we almost should say, which unconscious? Namely, is it that personal unconsciousness uh, which uh, is characteristic for a certain person, for a certain individual? Yes, so that you have the personal unconscious. This is one yes, unconscious. Yes, that is the personal and unconscious. And you call it the personal. And in, when in treatment, for instance, in the treatment of neurosis, you have to do with that personal unconscious for quite a while. And then only uh, dreams come that show that the collective unconscious is touched upon.
Now, as long as uh, d uh, there uh, is material uh, for, for personal nature, yes. you have to deal with the personal approaches. Yes. But when you get to, uh, uh, say, to a question, um, to a problem, which is no more merely personal, but also collective, you get collective dreams. Yes. Now, the, the distinction then between the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious then is that the personal is, uh, could be more involved with the immediate life of the individual oh yes. and the collective would be universal, would yes. be the same more have elements of uh, all men. But it would be uh, collective. Collective in the uh, For instance, you know, every society has collective problems. Yes. Collective convictions and so on. Yes. Now, we are very much influenced by them. Yes. For instance, you belong to a certain political party or yes. to a certain confession. Yes. And, uh, and that uh, uh, can be uh, a serious determinant of your behavior. Yes. Now, as long as your personal conflict doesn't touch upon it, it's, it's no question, it, it, it doesn't appear. But the moment yes. you transcend your personal sphere and come to your own personal determinants, say, to the question, a political question, or any other social question uh, which really matters to you, yes. then you are confronted with a collective problem and then you have collective dreams. Yes. I wonder if it would be too presumptuous for me to ask if you could for the moment think of an actual case of perhaps a patient or a friend in which you might show us rather specifically how the personal and the collective unconscious were acting in say his neurosis or perhaps in a problem that he may have well, you see, the, there is an, an, an enormous amount of personal dreams, for instance, and I couldn't possibly tell you just a moment, yes. simply for Amber yes. uh, th th there are millions of, of such personal dreams that simply deal, for instance, with the fact how your relation is to your father or to your mother or to your wife or yes. and so on, uh, with all sorts of individual variations. Yes. Now. Uh, but, uh, suppose um, a, 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 a patient uh, comes to, uh, to that, in, to, to that uh, level, or uh, that his conflict begins to become really very serious, so that his, uh, his uh, mind uh, might suffer. Uh, then he can have uh, a collective dream, yes. in, in which uh, uh, clearly uh, mythological motives appear. I see. Uh, there are, of, are plenty of examples in, in, in literature. Uh, All right. The book, you know, an introduction to, to uh, the, uh, the psychology of the unconscious, yes. there are such, uh, such dreams. Yes. And uh, that is, uh, can be, uh, I remember, for instance, uh, uh, a case uh, it was a very learned man and, and very rational. Yeah. And uh, uh, he um, had, of course, a lot of personal uh, uh, problems. And, uh, but they got so bad that he uh, um, got into, a, uh, into very disagreeable relations to his whole surroundings. Yeah. Uh, he was for uh, member of, of a society and, uh, and he got into a brawl with, with, with the people of that society, you know. Yes. Uh, and it was very sh uh, quite shocking. Yes. Now, uh, he started with, with collective dreams. Yes. Uh, suddenly he dreamt of things he had never thought of in his life before. Yes. Uh, mythological motives and, and he thought he was crazy. Yes. Because uh, he, he couldn't understand it at all. He just as if the whole world were transformed. Now that is uh, what you see in, 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 yeah. uh, in, in cases of schizophrenia. Yeah. So in that case, it was not a case of schizophrenia. Uh, as, as examples, you can take any, any, any of these collective things I published. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there are plenty. But for the moment, I cannot can remember a suitable uh, example, you know, to, to make it clear 
I should tell a long story. All right. Then you see uh, where it applies, uh, otherwise it, it makes no sense and, and something short. Well, I, I told you that case of that intuitive girl. Yes, yes. Uh, who suddenly uh, uh, came out with the statement that she has a black snake in, in yes, the belly. Yes, yes. Well, now, uh, that, is, that is a collective symbol. Yes, that yes. is not a, an, in, an individual fantasy. That yes. is a collective fantasy. A collective fantasy. Yes, that I is see. that is it well known in India. Yes. For instance, she has nothing to do with India, but uh, we have it too. It was generally human. Yeah. But it's entirely unknown. Yes. So that I even the first moment thought uh, perhaps he's crazy. Yeah. But she was only highly intuitive. Yes. It, it is in India known. It is the basis of a whole philosophical system of tantrism. Yes. Uh, uh, this is Kundalini. I Kundalini is uh, certain. I see. You see? And, uh, and that is something known to some few specialists. Yes. Uh, uh, generally, it's not known that w we have a, a certain I I I in the abdomen. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but that is a collective, you see? Yes. That is a yes. collective yes. dream yes. or a collective fantasy. Yes. Now, in day to day living, uh, the individual, uh, is it possible that things that uh, trouble him and cause tension that he represses? Now, these things that he represses will become part of the personal oh unconscious. Oh, yes, yes. Part yes, of the yes. personal unconscious. Yes, you see. Yes. He, he doesn't repress consciously always. Yes. Uh, these things disappear yes. simply. They disappear, yes. and Freud explains that by an act of repression. Yes. But you can prove that these things never have been conscious before. Yes, yes. They simply don't appear. I see. And you don't know why they don't yes. uh, appear. Of course, a prelude, you can say, when it comes up, you can say, ah, that is why they didn't appear, because they are very disagreeable or incompatible with his conscious views, with his conscious attitude. I see. Uh, but that is afterwards. You couldn't predict it. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, so you see, these things uh, that are, have an emotional tone. Yes. They are partially autonomous, yes. so that they can appear, or the contrary, they do not appear. Yes. They can disappear at wish, not of the subject, but of their own, yes. Yes. or you also can repress them. Yes. But it is uh, so the same is with, with, uh, with um, uh, projections. For instance, people say, uh, one makes projections. Yes. It's nonsense, one doesn't make them, one finds them. Yes. That are already there because the unconscious has, is here not conscious, but there it is conscious. Yes. In, in, my, in my brother. Yes. I, I, I see the, uh, the, the beam of my eye in, in the, as a splinter in my brother's eye. I see. You see? I see. I see. And that is right there because I am unconscious of the beam in my eye. I see, I see. The projections are not made. And so these, uh, uh, these disappearances or these re so-called depressions are uh, just like projections. They, instead of being projected into somebody or into something outside, they are introjected. They are already unconscious. Already unconscious, I see. But you are not the one that is doing it. I see. I uh, see. There are cases, sure, but uh, but uh, I should say the majority of cases are no repressions. Yes. They're simply, that was my first point of litigation with Freud. Yes, yes. Uh, I saw in the uh, association experiment that certain complexes are quite certainly not repressed. They simply won't appear. Yes, yes, yes. Because you see the unconscious is real. Yes. It is an entity. It, it, it works by itself. It see, is yes. autonomous. Yes, I see. So, in a sense, when in looking at um, uh, the so-called defense mechanisms that the mm -hmm. orthodox psychoanalysts speak of, like yeah. projection, rationalization, and so yes. on and so forth, yes. then, in a sense, the where you would differ from the orthodox psychoanalytic view, oh, yes. you, you would not say then that they are uh, a, a repressed type of way of defending a manner in which the ego is being defended, mm -hmm. but rather you would say that they were, they were already there. 
Yes. Yeah, they're simply a manifestations of patterns yeah. that are already yeah. present in, in, the, in the unconscious. Yes, and for instance, take that example of, the, of that serpent. Uh, that never has been repressed, you know, otherwise it should have been conscious to her, it was exactly unconscious to her, yes. and it only appears appeared in her fantasy. Yes, yes, I see. I see. It, it appeared spontaneously. Yes. She didn't know how she came to it. Yes. She said, well, I, I just saw it. Yes. Now, the, uh, some of the orthodox psychoanalysts might have said that this is a phallic symbol. Oh, yes, yes. of course, but you can't say anything. Yes. <laughs> You know, you can say a church spire is a phallic symbol. Yes. But when you dream of a penis, what is that? Yes. You know what an analyst said? Yes. Uh, one of the orthodox, yes. of the old God. Yes. He said, in this case, the sensor has uh, not functioned. Yes. yes. Now, you call that a scientific explanation. <laughs> Well, Professor Hume, in our several interesting discussions so far, a great deal of our talk has been some of the very fundamental aspects of your theory and your writing, and of course, the purpose in, in getting some of your reactions to these fundamental ideas was so that our students, many of whom have not had an opportunity to study a great deal of your work, might sort of be introduced to some of your ideas from you personally, which of course is probably the best way they possibly could be. Now, of course, as one looks over your work, one is impressed with a much broader scope, of course, and the, just the beginning fundamental outline of a uh, theory of personality. Well, of, of course, uh, when you study uh, human psychology, you can't help noticing that uh, man doesn't, man's psychology doesn't only consist of the ramifications of instinct in his behavior. Uh, this uh, is, is up, are not the only determinants. There are many others, and uh, the study of man from his biological aspect only is by far uh, insufficient to understand human psychology. Uh, it is <coughs> absolutely necessary that you uh, study man also in his uh, social uh, and general uh, environments. Yes. And uh, <coughs> so you have to um, consider, for instance, the fact that there are uh, different kinds of society, different kinds of nations, uh, different traditions, um, uh, and to that purpose, it is absolutely necessary that one uh, treats the, the problem of the human psyche uh, from many standpoints. Um, and each is a, a most considerable task, naturally. Um, <coughs> thus, when I, uh, after my uh, association experiments, when I realized um, that there is obviously an unconscious, uh, the question arose, now what is this unconscious? Does it consist merely of rests, of remnants, of uh, conscious activities, or are there uh, things that are practically forever unconscious? In other words, is the unconscious a factor in itself? And I soon came to the conclusion that the unconscious must be a factor in itself uh, because I observed time and again that, for instance, uh, uh, people's dreams or um, uh, schizophrenic patients' uh, delusions and fantasies uh, contain the motives which they couldn't possibly have acquired uh, in our surroundings. Um, this depends upon the fact that mm, uh, the child is not born tabula rasa, but it is a, a definite mixture of or combination of genes. Uh, and <coughs> the, the gene, uh, although the genes seem to contain 
euh, tous ces dynamiques euh, facteurs arrangeurs of, uh, of a certain behavior, um, they have a, a tremendous importance also for the arrangement of the psyche. Uh, the psyche too, uh, in as much as it uh, appears naturally, before it appears you cannot study it, but in as much as it appears, it uh, has certain qualities, it has a certain character, and that, that uh, needs must depend upon the elements born in the child. So, <coughs> uh, uh, factors uh, determining human behavior are born with the child uh, and determine its uh, further uh, development. Now that is one side of the picture. The other side of the picture is the individual lives in connection with others in certain definite surroundings that will influence the given combination of qualities. And, and that is now also a very complicated factor because the environmental influences are not merely personal. Uh, there are uh, any amount of objective factors, uh, the, uh, the general social conditions, uh, uh, laws, uh, convictions, uh, ways of looking at things, of dealing with things. Now, these things are not <coughs> of an arbitrary um, uh, character. They are uh, uh, historical. There are historical reasons why things are they are. And <coughs> as there are historical reasons for the qualities of the psyche uh, that is born, uh, it, 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 is, is uh, such a thing as uh, the history of uh, man's evolution in, in, in the past uh, years. And uh, that shows that a real understanding of the psyche must consist in the elucidation uh, of the uh, history uh, of the human race. Uh, history of the mind, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, as uh, uh, of the biological, uh, exactly as the biological data. So, uh, when I uh, uh, wrote my first uh, uh, book uh, concerning the psychology of the unconscious, um, I already had formed uh, a certain idea of the uh, nature of the unconscious. Uh, to me it was then uh, a living a remnant of the original history of man, living in, in his uh, uh, surroundings. A very complicated picture. Uh, of course, you brought up many, many very, of course, very interesting and provocative ideas here as you have, of course, in your many, many uh, thousands of pages of writing and written work. And, uh, of course, running through all your work, there are many of these ideas in the, the personal unconscious, the race unconscious, the self, the ego, the persona, yeah. uh, the, the energy principles, such as we mentioned entropy and equivalence and so on, in a sense, the first and second law of thermodynamics, I believe, as you uh, suggest or allude to. And uh, uh, now, in trying to look at the whole person, of course, uh, uh, when is struck that, that you are trying hard to look at the whole person, that you don't want to look at these little parts of this person, but feel there's sort of a total future realization of the whole that may be very important. That uh, you talk, for example, about a process of individuation, how this whole person emerges, if I'm not mistaken. Would you like to comment a little bit upon this, this process of individuation, this process, uh, how all these factors move toward a whole, a totality? Well, you know, that's something quite simple. It, uh, uh, take uh, an acorn, yes. put it into the ground, it grows, and it becomes an, uh, an oak. Yes. 
You see, that is man. Yes. Uh, man develops from an egg. Yes. And develops in the whole, I, I, into the whole man. Yes. And, and that is the law that is, is in him. Well, when you spoke with uh, uh, Dr. Einstein in your early discussion, yeah. you were saying earlier that uh, uh, he more or less tried out some of his ideas on you. Yeah. Did you ever uh, uh, bring to him the possibility or ask his opinion about the possibility that relativity might apply to psychic function? Did you ever, did you ever discuss that particular point? Well, you see, uh, you know uh, uh, how it is that a man is so concentrated upon his own idea. Yes. Uh, uh, and when he is a mathematician yeah. on top of everything, yeah. <laughs> uh, then uh, you are not welcome. Well, when you spoke with uh, uh, Dr. Einstein in your early discussion, yeah. you were saying earlier that uh, uh, he more or less tried out some of his ideas on you. Yeah. Did you ever uh, uh, bring to him the possibility or ask his opinion about the possibility that relativity might apply to psychic function? Did you ever, did you ever discuss that particular point? Well, you see, uh, you know uh, uh, how it is that a man is so concentrated upon his own idea. Yes. Uh, uh, and when he is a mathematician yeah. on top of everything, yeah. <laughs> uh, then uh, you are not welcome. Yes, that's right. <laughs> what year was it that you were uh, uh, friends with Einstein? What, when mm, well, I wouldn't call myself a friend. I was, I was simply the host. No. <laughs> This is what year was it possible? And that I tried to listen and to understand. <laughs> uh, and so there was little chance to insert uh, some of my own ideas. Yes. Was this uh, after he'd already formulated the relativity theory or, or just before? Well, it was just when he, uh, when he worked on it. Just when he was, while yes. he was working on yes. it? Yes, yes. That is very interesting. Right in the beginning. Yes, yes. It yes. was very interesting. Yes. Very interesting. In, in your dealings with, we, uh, with, um, Professor Toynbee, you know, we were discussing yes. that, you, that you knew him, had contact with him. Uh, have you uh, uh, gotten rather interested in his ideas in, of history? Oh, yes, you see, his uh, ideas are, are about the, the life of civilizations. Uh, uh, that is ruled by archetypal uh, forms. Yes. And uh, uh, Toynbee has seen that uh, what I mean by the uh, historical function of uh, archetypal developments. I see. Uh, see, that is a, a mighty important uh, uh, determinant of human behavior yes. uh, that uh, lasts for centuries or for thousands of years yes. and expresses itself in, in, in symbols. Yes. Sometimes symbols, you, you would think nothing of it. For instance, you, you know that the, uh, the, the Russia, the Soviet republics, have that symbol of the red star. Yes. Now, it's a, a five red, uh, red star. Yes. Uh, America has the five red white star. Yes. They are enemies. Yes. They can't come together. Now, you, in the Middle Ages, for about at least 2,000 years, uh, the red and the white is the couple. I see. That is ultimately destined to marry each other. Yes, yes, I see. I see. Uh, very, very interesting. You see? Very interesting. Yes. And so, uh, America is a sort of matriarchy in as much as, as most of the money is in the hands of women. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's right. And, and <laughs> Russia is the land of the little father. Yes. You see, that's the patriarchy. Yes, uh, very, very interesting. So it is father and mother, you know. Uh, the, the white woman, in Middle Ages, as they call it, the white woman, the Felina Candida, and the Servus Rubeus, the red slave. I see, yes, yes. Okay. Now, so it was, it was going to happen. Yes, yeah, it's the two. Uh, uh, two lovers have fallen with each other. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was about to discuss, bring, ask you a little bit about what seems to be a very fundamental part of your, your writing and your ideas, and it's uh, encased in the term uh, Mandela. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now this seems to be sort of an ultimate realization, a uh, direction, and I was certainly 
be most interested in hearing your observations on this, this idea. Well, Mandala is just a one typical uh, archetypal form. Yes. It is the what they call in alchemy the quadratura circuli, yes. the square in the in the circle. Yes. Or the circle in the square. Yes. And it, it is uh, an age-old symbol. Yes. Uh, that goes right back in the, in the prehistory of man, yes. and it's all over the earth. Yes. And uh, it uh, either expresses the, the, the deity or the self. Yes. And uh, and th th these two terms are psychologically very uh, much related. Yes. But which doesn't mean that I believe that God is a self or that that's a self is God. I see. I, I make that statement that yes. there is a psychological relation. Yes. And that can be uh, have plenty of evidence for it. Yes. And uh, it is a, a very important archetype. It's the archetype of an inner author. I see. Uh, and uh, uh, it is always used in that sense, either to make an uh, the arra arrangement of the many, many aspects of the universe, uh, a world scheme, or uh, a scheme of uh, uh, our psyche. Yes. And uh, it expresses uh, the fact that there is a center and a periphery. Yes. And, uh, and it tries to embrace the whole. It's a, a, a symbol of wholeness. Wholeness. Uh -huh. So you see, uh, in a moment where, uh, say, in a, during a, uh, a, tr a treatment, uh, when there is great disorder and chaos uh, in a man's mind, yes. uh, then this symbol can appear as a, in the form of a mandala in a dream or when he makes imaginary fantastical drawings or yes. something of the sort. Uh, there is spontaneously appears uh, as a compensatory archetype, bringing order, showing the possibility of order. So uh, sort of, of direction of all. Centeredness. Yes. Centeredness. Centeredness, yes. And it is a center which is not coincident with, it, with the ego, but with the wholeness, with this wholeness. Yes. The our wholeness, which I call the self. Yes. This is the term for wholeness. Yes. And and I am not whole in my ego. I my see. ego is, is a fragment yes, a of fragment my personality. Of itself, yes. So you see, uh, it, that the center of a mandala uh, is not the ego, it, it is the whole personality. The whole self. The center of the whole personality. Yes. And uh, uh, it plays a very great role in the East, for instance. Uh, uh, but in the Middle Ages, equally. Yes. Uh, and and then it, it has been lost, it has been thought of as a mere uh, sort of uh, allegorical uh, decorative uh, motif. But uh, as, uh, as a matter of fact, it is uh, uh, a highly important and, and highly autonomous uh, uh, symbol that appears in dreams and, and so on, or in folklore. Yes. Uh, yes. This is, uh, Yes. This is what could easily say that it's the main archetype. Yes, yes. Now, um, in speaking of um, this uh, totality, which you say is sort of unified in the self, and of course, as you suggested here, that the mandala is this very important archetype symbolizing this balance, I believe, as you yes. alluded to here. Yes. Um, of course, um, sometimes we, we try in psychology to start from whatever totality does exist in the individual and try to sort of look into uh, underlying motivation. And we have recently uh, used a great deal of certain types of testing that we call projective tests. And as you've already suggested, and we all know, of course, very well that you certainly uh, played a major role in developing this point of view with your word association method. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, to a great degree, uh, the, uh, another uh, very Interesting development, of course, about 1922, Herman Rorschach developed uh, his Ro inkblot or Rorschach test. Now, um, first of all, to even talk a little bit more about word association work, we talked a little bit about it already. We heard your comments on it. Uh, we'd like to, if it would, uh, if we could here perhaps get into it in a little bit more detail. Now, uh, first of all, what are the ingredients of the word association test? What 
What what are, what is involved in the use of it? You mean the practical? Yes, yeah, the practical use of it. Yes. Who? Oh, well, you see, in the in the beginning, uh, when I was a young man, of course, I I was completely dis dis disoriented with, with, with patients. I didn't didn't know where to begin or what to say. Yes, yes. And the association I found has given me the chance to uh, offer access to their own cultures. Yeah. I, I, I learned about the things that did not tell me. Yeah, yeah. And I got the, a deep insight in yeah. into the things uh, they did not know. Yeah, and yeah. they discovered many things. Now, would you say that uh, from responses, and as you say, complexes, or sort of emotional yes, blocks... Yes, that is the main thing. Of course, this word complex, I know, is, 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 uh, is yes, a word that, that you originated. Uh, it's used very really widely the now. The, the, you know, uh, uh, the diffuse between the complex, that is, uh, yes. was, was my term. Yes, yes. Now, do you hope from these complexes or emotional blocks that you uncover as you administer this test to get at materials of the personal unconscious or the racial unconscious or all of the factors well, that influence this individual? You know, uh, in the beginning there was no question of a, uh, a collective unconscious oh or yes. something like that. Uh, it is uh, chiefly. Um, the ordinary personal contact is yeah. that, that I see, idea. I see. You weren't, you weren't expecting to get into such uh, depth. Uh, among among uh, hundreds of uh, uh, complex uh, associations, uh, there might appear an archetypal uh, yeah. element, but that wouldn't show possible. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that um, is not important. You know it is a, like a rock shock, a superficial yeah. uh, orientation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you uh, uh, knew Herman Rorschach, I believe, did, did you not? Uh, no, he has uh, circumvented me as much as possible. Yes. <laughs> but uh, did you get to know him uh, personally? No, 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 you did not. No, you did I not. never saw him. Yes. No. In his intro-tensive and extra-tensive ideas, of course, he's talking a great deal about your introversion and extroversion ideas and his own yes, interpretation. Yes, uh, I, uh, I was an anathema <laughs> because I, ha I had first said it, you see, and that is Unforgivable. <laughs> I never so, have done so you really didn't have any personal contact with Rorschach? No personal relation at all. No, I see. Uh, are you familiar with, with his test? Have you seen his test, the Rorschach test? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yes. I know it. Yes. Uh, but yes. I never applied it. You, you know, never I applied the test? Because I later on, of course, I didn't apply the association test anymore because it wasn't necessary. Yes. I, I, I learned what I had to learn yes. uh, for it, but for the uh, exact uh, uh, examination of uh, psychic reactions, uh, I think it is uh, a very excellent means. Yes, yes. Well, d would you say, for example, that uh, the practicing psychiatrist, the clinical psychologist, or the practicing psychiatrist, uh, could use the projective tests like the for instance, you see, to for the education of a uh, psychologist. Yes. Uh, a practical psychologist who yes. is meant to do actual work with, with people. Yes. I, I think it's all the best means to make him see how the unconscious works. Is that right? The projective test. Yeah, it's yeah. Exceed, exceedingly didactic. Uh -huh. I see. Um. Uh, then can demonstrate uh, uh, repression or uh, the, um, uh, am uh, the um, uh, amnestic phenomena, uh, uh, the, sort, the, the, the way in which people cover their emotions and so on. Yeah, yeah. It is uh, like a, 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 um, an ordinary conversation, uh, but seen and measured in its principles. Yeah. And that makes it so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You observe all the things you observe in the conversation. Yeah. For instance, you ask people something, you discuss certain things, and you observe little hesitations, uh, mistakes in speech, certain gestures, all that comes to the foreground in the, and measurable, you know, yeah. in, the, yeah. uh, in the experiment. And so it is, uh, 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 I think I don't overrate the didactic value of it. I, I think very highly of it. Yes. Yes, yes. I mean, still uh, use it in, in the education of, of young uh, yeah. uh, 
Now, um, in, the, in the whole matter of, of psychosomatic medicine, uh, they have now, for example, very recently hinted that cancer may have psychosomatic involvement. A number oh, of yes, yes, yes. Uh, this doesn't surprise you that... No, the so I mean, all these things, things are only in the whole... And, and it'll be, it'll be that, uh, that 50 years ago, we already had these cases, you know, uh, uh, ulcer of the stomach, tuberculosis, uh, uh, chronic uh, um, arthritis, uh, 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 skin diseases. Yes. All psychogenous uh, under certain conditions. Yes. And even, even cancer, the fact that cancer may have... Uh, well, you see, I couldn't swear. Yes, uh, yes. I, uh, but I have seen cases where I thought now I should wonder uh, whether there was not a, a psychogenic, uh, psychogenic reason uh, for that particular ailment. Yes. It came too, uh, too conveniently. Too conveniently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and so some of the studies that, for example, in the United States show that, uh, for example, Jewish women practically never get cancer in the vaginal region. Yes. We're more often to get cancer, say, in the breast region, yes. as one example. Yes. And well, uh, uh, many things can be found out about cancer, I'm sure. Uh, you see, to, to us it was always a question how to, to, to treat these things, and uh, uh, anything is possible, every disease has a psych psychological uh, uh, accompaniment. Yeah. And uh, you, uh, it all depends, perhaps life depends uh, upon it, whether you treat such a patient psycholog psychologically in the proper way or not. Yes. That can help tremendously. Yes. Even if you cannot prove in the least that uh, 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 the, the, the disease itself is psychogenous. Yes. Or you can have, you have an infectious disease in a certain moment uh, of, of, a, of a psychic ailment or predicament. Yes. Uh, because you are uh, you are particularly accessible to an infection. Yes. For the angina is is such a typical psychological disease. Yes. Yes. Yet it is not psychological in its physical uh, causation. Yes. Yes. It's just an infection. Yes. But why then? Well, it was a psychological moment. Yes, yes. And you see, when it is established and there's high fear and an abscess, you cannot cure it by psychology. Yes, yes. Yet, uh, uh, it, it, it is quite possible that you uh, can avoid it by a, a proper psychological attitude. Yes, yes. So all of this interest in, in psychosomatic medicine is pretty old stuff to you. <laughs> You've been talking uh, this for a long these time. These things are known here long, long ago. Yes, yes. And so you're not at all surprised by the new development. Well, for instance, yes. the, the, the toxic aspect of, of, of schizophrenia. Yes. I had published it 50 years ago. Yes. Just 50 years ago. Yes. Uh, now, now one, one discovers it. Yes. You yes. see, you are far ahead in America with the technological things. But uh, in, in, in psychological matters and, and such things, uh, you're 50 years back. Yes. Yeah. You see, you don't <laughs> understand it. And that's a fact. I, I'm sorry, you see, I, I, don't, I don't want to uh, tell you that. The general collective statement, yeah. you know, <laughs> you simply are not yet aware of, of, of what there is. Yes. Uh, there are plenty more things than, than people have have an idea of. I told you that there is a pathologian who didn't even know what a horoscope was from and thought it was a horoscope. You see, everyone who says that I'm a, a mystic, you know, uh, is just uh, an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't uh, understand the first word of, of psychology. Yeah. Well, Professor Jung, in our several interesting discussions so far, a great deal of our talk has been some of the very fundamental aspects of your theory, your writing, and of course, the purpose in, in getting some of your reactions to these fundamental ideas was so that our students, many of whom have not had an opportunity to study a great deal of your work, might sort of be introduced to some of your ideas from you personally, which of course is probably the best way they possibly could be. Now, of course, 
As one looks over your work, one is impressed with a much broader scope, of course, than the, just the beginning fundamental outline of a uh, theory of personality. Well, uh, of course, uh, when you study uh, human psychology, you can't help noticing that uh, man doesn't, man psychology doesn't only consist of the ramifications of instinct in his behavior. Uh, this uh, instincts are, are not the only determinants. There are many other, and uh, the study of man from his biological aspect only is by far uh, insufficient to understand human psychology. Uh, it is <coughs> absolutely necessary that you uh, study man also in his uh, social uh, and general uh, environment. Yes. And uh, <coughs> so you have to um, consider, for instance, the fact that there are uh, different kinds of society different kinds of nations, uh, different traditions, um, uh, and to that purpose it is absolutely necessary that one uh, treats the, the problem of the human psyche uh, from many standpoints, um, and each is a, a most considerable task, naturally. Um, <coughs> Thus, when I, uh, after my uh, association experiments, when I realized um, that there is obviously an unconscious, uh, the question arose, now what is this unconscious? Does it consist merely of rests, of remnants, of uh, conscious activities, or are there uh, things that are practically forever unconscious, but in other words, is the unconscious a uh, factor in itself? And mm, I soon came to the conclusion that the unconscious must be a factor in itself, um, because I observed time and again that, uh, for instance, uh, 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 people's dreams or um, uh, schizophrenic patients, uh, delusions, and fantasies uh, contain the motives which they couldn't possibly have acquired uh, in our surroundings. Um, this uh, depends upon the fact that uh, the child is not born tabula rasa, but it is a, a definite mixture of or combination of genes. Uh, and <coughs> The gene, uh, although the genes seem to contain um, chiefly dynamic uh, factors, uh, arrangeurs of, uh, of a certain behavior, um, they have a, a tremendous importance also for the arrangement of the psyche. Uh, the psyche too, uh, in as much as it uh, appears naturally. Before it appears, you cannot study it, but in as much as it appears, it uh, has certain qualities, it has a certain character, and uh, that uh, needs must depend upon the elements born in the child. So, <coughs> uh, uh, factors uh, determining human behavior are born with the child. Uh, and determine its uh, further uh, development. Now that is one side of the picture. The other side of the picture is the individual lives in connection with others in certain definite surroundings that will influence the given combination of qualities. And, and that is now also a very complicated factor, because the environmental influences are not merely 
personal uh, terror uh, elements of objective factors, uh, the, uh, the general social conditions, uh, uh, laws, uh, convictions, uh, ways of looking at things, of dealing with things. Now, these things are not <coughs> of an arbit arbitrary um, uh, character. They are uh, uh, historical. There are historical reasons why things are they are. And <coughs> as there are historical reasons for the qualities of the psyche uh, that is born, uh, there is, is a such a thing as the history of uh, man's evolution in, in, in the past uh, eons. And uh, that shows that real understanding of the psyche must consist in the elucidation uh, of the uh, history uh, of the human race. Uh, history of the mind, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, as uh, uh, of the biological, uh, that there is the biological data. So, uh, when I uh, uh, wrote my first uh, uh, book uh, concerning the psychology of the unconscious, um, I already had formed uh, a certain idea of the uh, nature of the unconscious. Uh, to me it was then uh, a living a remnant of the original history of man, living in, in his uh, uh, surroundings. A very complicated picture. And uh, uh, my material then, my uh, empirical material, was formed uh, chiefly by lunatics, by uh, uh, cases of schizophrenia. And there I had observed that there are, uh, chiefly in the beginning of a disease, uh, uh, invasions of fantasies into conscious life, fantasies of an entirely unexpected uh, uh, sort, most bewildering to the patient. He gets quite confused by these ideas and he gets into a sort of panic because he never before has thoughts, thought such things that they are quite strange to him and equally strange to his, his uh, uh, physician. Mm -hmm. you see, the agent is, is equally dumbfounded Yes. by uh, the peculiar character of those uh, fantasies. Yes. And therefore one says that man is crazy. Yes. He's crazy yes. to think such things. Yes. Nobody thinks such yes. things. Yes. And the patient uh, uh, agrees with, in a way with him. If he, uh, he would at least agree, or he does even agree. Uh, and, and all the more he gets into a panic. So, uh, as a alienist, I... Uh, I thought it uh, to be uh, really the task for psychiatry to elucidate that thing that broke into consciousness, the, these voices, these delusions, yes. uh, uh, and uh, in those days, uh, that is, mind you, uh, more than 40 years ago, or almost 50 years ago, uh, I had no hope to be able to treat these cases or to to be able to help them, but I had a very uh, um, great scientific curiosity, and I wanted to know what these things really were, because I thought that this, uh, these things had, had a system, they were not merely chaotic, decayed material, uh, because there was too, too much sense uh, in, in those fantasies. So, what I did then was I studied uh, cases of uh, psychogenic uh, diseases uh, like hysteria, hysteric sim somnambulism and such things where the content that came from the unconscious were 
in a readable condition, in an understandable condition. And, uh, and then I saw that in contradistinction to the schizophrenics, the mental contents of hysterics were of a humanly understandable character. That is, they were even uh, elaborate, uh, dramatic, uh, suggestive, uh, insinuating. Um, so one could make out uh, a second personality. Now, this yeah. is not the case of schizophrenia. Yeah. There, the fantasies, on the contrary, are unsystematic, con uh, chaotic, and you cannot make out a proper second uh, personality. Uh, apart from, from rare uh, ex uh, 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 cases uh, of, a, of a complicated nature. Now, uh, I, uh, I knew of psychopathic cases, just you know, in, in the balance between uh, schizophrenia and um, hysteria. Uh, where uh, ideas came up, uh, delusions that uh, were not exactly hysterical because they were singularly difficult to understand, it was uh, a sort of strange, strange eruptions and, uh, and I thought uh, that uh, th these, th these cases could give me uh, a better understanding, so I uh, took the opportunity when um, Professor Flurma, the, the old uh, 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 professor of psychology and philosophy at the University of Geneva, when he published a case of an American girl who had uh, bestowed upon him uh, uh, a series of half poetic uh, and romantic fantasies, uh, uh, he, he published this, uh, that, that material uh, without uh, commenting uh, on them. Uh, he, he gave it as an example of creative imagination. Now when I read those fantasies, I saw this is exactly the material. Um, and uh, I was always a bit afraid when I, uh, that, that people, when I tell of my personal experiences with patients that I would say, oh, this is a merely suggestion, you know. Yeah. I took that case uh, because uh, I surely had no hand in it. It was old Professor Flunua, an authority. He was a friend of William James. Uh, I, I knew him personally, a well, well, fine old man. And he, uh, uh, he certainly wouldn't be accused of, That's right. of uh, uh, having influenced the patient. Yes. And that is the reason why I, I analyzed these fantasies, and that uh, they became then that case became the object of a whole book uh, yes. called *The Psychology of the Unconscious*. It is called now *Symbolisms of Transformation*. Yes. And uh, I have revised it after 40, 40 years. It needed it yeah. because it was in the yeah. first, the first attempt. Yes. yes. And uh, and there I I tried to show that the, there is a sort of unconscious, I then simply called it the unconscious, that clearly produces things which are historical and not personal. Yes. The, it, it, it was mythological material of uh, the nature of which was it understood, neither by Professor Flora nor by the patient. And um, and, and there I uh, tried for the first time to uh, produce a picture of the, the functioning of the unconscious, uh, a functioning which allowed certain conclusions as to the nature of the unconscious. Then, uh, after I had written that book, that cost me my friendship with Freud because he couldn't accept it. Yes. Uh, he, 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 to him, the unconscious was a, a, a product of consciousness, yes. uh, and uh, it simply contained uh, the remnants. 
and he was a sort of, of a storeroom where all of these carton things of consciousness were, uh, were heaped up and left. And but to, to me, the unconscious then was already a, a matrix, a, a, a sort of a basis of consciousness of a creative nature, namely capable of autonomous acts, yes. uh, o autonomous intrusions into yes. consciousness. Yes. Uh, in other words, I took the existence of the unconscious for a, a real fact, uh, or for a real autonomous factor capable of independent action. Yes. And now that was uh, a problem, uh, a psychological problem of the very first order. And uh, that made me think and furiously, because the whole of philosophy nowadays has not yet recognized this fact that we have a counteractor in our unconscious, that in our psyche there are two consciousness is one factor and there is another factor equally important that is the unconscious that can uh, <coughs> uh, interfere with consciousness any time it pleases. And of course I, I, I say to myself now uh, this is uh, very uncomfortable. Uh, because uh, uh, I think I am the only master in my house, but I, uh, I must have, uh, admit that there is uh, another somebody in that house that can uh, play tricks. And I had to deal with the unfortunate <laughs> victims of that interference every day in my patients. So the next thing I wrote was in 1918, uh, namely a disquisition about the relations between the ego and the unconscious, where I tried to formulate the experiences that are more or less regularly observable uh, in cases where uh, a, a, a consciousness is exposed to unconscious data to or in interferences or intrusions. Uh, where the unconscious is considered as an autonomous factor that has to be taken seriously. Uh, where one cannot, where one doesn't say anymore or undervalue the unconscious by assuming it is nothing but a discarded remnant of consciousness. It is a factor in its own dignity and, and a very important factor because it can create uh, the most uh, horrible disturbances. Uh, now, when I, that was a, a pamphlet I wrote, uh, it was published in French and, and uh, nobody understood it. Uh, I saw that the reason why nobody understands it is that why nobody has a, a similar experience because the, the question hasn't been pursued to such a and uh, namely that one has taken the unconscious seriously and considered it as a real uh, factor uh, that can determine its human behavior uh, to a very considerable degree. Do you think that the humanities mm -hmm. are important for the individual mm -hmm. who, who wants to study mm -hmm. the individual? One doesn't see what uh, an education without humanities is doing to man. Yes. He loses the connection with, uh, with, uh, with his family, as it were. That means with his, the whole stem, the, 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 the tribe, uh, the connection with the past, that he lives in that in which man always has lived. Man has always lived in the midst. And uh, we think we are able to be born today and to live in no in without history. That's, uh, that's, that is a, a disease that's absolutely abnormal because man is not born every day. He is once born in a, in a specific historical setting 
with the specific historical qualities and therefore he is only complete when he has a relation to, to these things. It's just as if you were born without eyes and ears uh, when, you are born, when you are growing up with no connection with the past. From the, natural, the center of natural science, you need no connection with the past. You yes. can wipe it out. Yes. Yes. And that is that is a, a, a mutilation of, of of the human being. Now I saw uh, from a practical experience that uh, this uh, kind of proceeding uh, had a most extraordinary therapeutic effect. Um, I can uh, tell you such a case uh, that was a, uh, a, a young uh, Jewish uh, girl and uh, she, uh, her father was uh, uh, a banker and she had received an uh, entirely worldly education. And she had no idea of, of any, any tradition or so. And then I, uh, I went further into her history and found out that, that her grandfather had been uh, a sadic mm -hmm. in, in Galicia. And, and, uh, and when I knew that, I knew the whole story. That girl suffered from uh, a, a phobia, a terrific phobia that had been a, in, a, in a psychoanalytic treatment already uh, with no effect. Uh, and she was really uh, badly plagued by that uh, phobia, uh, anxiety stage of all sorts. Of. And, um, and then I saw that girl has lost the connection with the past, has lost, for instance, the fact that her grandfather was a sadic, that he lived in the midst, and uh, he, her father w was out, has fallen out of it too. So I, I simply told her, uh, you, see, you will understand what your fear is. You know what you have lost. And they didn't, of course not. I said, your fear is, is the fear of your way. Mm. You know the effect was that within a week she was cured from, from so many years of, of bad and bad stage. Because you see that went like a lightning for her. But, uh, I only could say it because I knew that that she is absolutely lost. She, she thought she was in the middle of things, but she was lost, gone. No, made no sense. Well, what, well, what is the ex uh, our existence? You know, when we, when when we are just average uh, numbers. You know, the more you you make people to average numbers, the more you uh, you, you destroy our society. Yeah. The ideal states than a slave state, then you can uh, go to Russia, there is, there is wonderful, uh, there you can be a number, but uh, <laughs> one pays it very nearly, it, uh, our whole life goes to, to blazes, okay. uh, and so we have uh, plenty of cases uh, of a similar uh, kind, and that has uh, naturally uh, led me on to a uh, profound uh, study of the archetype. So, Professor Jung, so you began to see, in a sense, your typology led to a sort of a theory of a psychology of opposites, that the conscious uh, would reveal one side of, of, of a type and the unconscious would be a, uh, the other side. Yeah. And that this would be a very important way, then, of helping yeah. you to analyze yeah. and understand the individual. Oh, well, yeah, diagnostically, it is yes. uh, quite, uh, from a practical point of view, uh, uh, quite important. Uh, well, the point I wanted to elucidate is you know, in uh, in analyzing a patient, you uh, make a typical uh, experiences. Namely, there is a sort of typical way in which the uh, integration of consciousness uh, takes place. Namely, the, the, the average way is that um, through the analysis of dreams, for instance, you become acquainted with the contents of the unconscious. I already told you this to, to, to begin with all personal material. 
yeah. um, uh, subjective uh, questions, uh, uh, questions of the individual's uh, difficulties in adapting to uh, environmental uh, uh, conditions and so on. Yeah. Now, it is a regular uh, observation that when you talk to an individual and this individual gives you um, insight into its uh, uh, inner preoccupations, interests, emotions, the other words, uh, hands over uh, his uh, personal complexes, then you get slowly and nilly willy into the situation of a, of a sort of authority, yeah. uh, uh, a point of, you become a point of reference. Uh, you know you are in possession of all uh, the important items in a, in a person's development. I remember, for instance, I analyzed uh, a very well-known uh, American politician and uh, he told me, oh, any amount of the secrets of his trade. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and suddenly he jumped up and said, by God, what have I done? You know, you, you, you get a million dollars for what I have told you now. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I'm not interested. You can sleep in peace, I shall not betray you. <laughs> I forget it within a fortnight. <laughs> now, you see, that shows that uh, the things people hand out are not merely uh, indifferent things. When it comes to something important, emotionally important, then they hand out themselves. They hand out a big emotional uh, value, as if they were handing over a large sum, as if they were trusting you with, uh, with the administration of their estate. Yes. And they're entirely in your hands. Yes. Uh, often, you, need, uh, I, you know, I hear things well, <laughs> that could ruin those people, utterly fabricated it own. Or uh, it, uh, it, it would give me, if I should have any blackmailing tendencies, uh, uh, unlimited power to, to the blackmail them. Now, you see, that creates an emotional relationship to the analyst. And that is what Freud called the platform. Yes. which is a, a central problem of, um, uh, of analytic psychology. Uh, it is just so as if these people had handed out the, uh, their uh, whole existence. And uh, that can have very peculiar effects upon the individual. E either they hate you for it or they love you for it. Yeah. Uh, but you are not indifferent to them. And uh, uh, there is then a sort of emotional uh, relation uh, between the patient and uh, the doctor. Yes. Now, uh, you know, when you hand out such materials, then you, uh, these contents are associated with all the important persons in the life of a patient. Now, the most important persons are usually father and mother. Yeah. That comes up from childhood. The first brothers are with the parents as a rule. So, in handing over your infantile memories uh, about the father or about the mother, you hand over also the image of father and mother. Uh, then it is just as if the doctor had taken the place of the father, yes. even of the mother. Yes. I had quite a number of male patients that called me Mother Jung. 
because they handed over the mother to me. Yes, yes. Curiously enough. Yes. But you see, that's quite irrespective, uh, irrespective of the personality of the, of the analyst. It is simply disregarded. He functions as if he were the mother, or he functions as if he were the father, uh, the of central authority. And uh, uh, now that is what one calls transference. That's a case, a, a particular case of trans uh, of, uh, of projection. Yes. Now, Freud yes. doesn't exactly call it projection. He calls it transference. Yes. Uh, that is uh, an allusion to the old uh, and superstitious idea of handing over a disease, yes. transferring a disease upon an animal, or <coughs> the handing over the sin upon a scapegoat, and yes. the scapegoat takes it out into the desert to make it disappear. Yes, yes. Uh, so they hand over themselves uh, in the hope that I can swallow that stuff and digest it for them. <laughs> And so I'm in the in the in, in, in local parentis and have a high authority. Uh, or naturally I'm also persecuted by the corresponding uh, resistances, by all the, the manifold uh, emotional reactions they have had against their parents. Now, that is the stuff you have to work through first uh, in analyzing the situation. Because a patient is a triple disease, he's not free, he's the slave, he's, he's utterly dependent upon, uh, upon the doctor, uh, like a patient with an open abdomen on, on the operation table. Yes. He is uh, in the hands of the surgeon for better or worse. Uh, and so the thing must be finished. And so we have to work through that condition in the hope that we arrive uh, on a, uh, in a situation where the patient is able to see that I'm not the father or not the mother, that I am an ordinary human being. Now, everybody naturally should assume that uh, such a thing would be possible, for instance, that, you, that a patient could arrive at such an insight when he's not a complete idiot, uh, that, that I am just a, a doctor and, and not that emotional figure of their uh, fantasies, but that is very often not the case. So I had a, a, a case that was a, an intelligent uh, 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 young woman. She was a, a student of philosophy, very good mind, where one could expect easily that she would see uh, that I am not the, 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 the parental authority. But she was actually unable to uh, to get out of this delusion uh, and in such a, in such a case one, uh, one always had recourse to the dreams one it is just as if one would ask the unconscious now what do you say to such a condition you see she says of the unconscious of course i know you are not my father but uh, i just feel like that it is like that it, 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 i depend upon you and uh, and I say, now we see what the unconscious says. Now the unconscious produced dreams in, in, in which I really assumed a very curious role. You know, uh, she was a little infant, she was sitting on my knees, I held her in my arms, I was a very tender father to the little girl, you know, and, uh, um, uh, uh, and more and more her dreams became emphatic in that respect. Namely, that I was a, a, a sort of giant, and, uh, and she is a very little, frail human uh, thing, you know, and uh, uh, quite a little girl in the hands of an enormous being. Uh, and the last dream of that series was, I cannot tell you all the things, yes. was that I, uh, uh, it was out in nature, I stood in a field of wheat, in an enormous field of wheat that was ripe for house. And I was a child. And I held her in my arm like a baby. And the wind was blowing over that field of wheat. Now you know when the wind is blowing over wheat fields, these waves in the wheat field. Yeah, yeah. And with these waves, I swayed like a, uh, 
putting her, as if it were, to sleep, you know. And she, feel, she felt uh, as being in the arms of, a, of, a God, of, 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 of the Godhead. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, so now, now the, the harvest is ripe. Yeah. And I must tell her. And I told her, you see, what you want and what you project into me, because you are not conscious of it, is you, you, you have the idea of a deity you don't possess. Therefore you see it in me. Yeah. Uh, that clip. Mm. Because, you know, she had a, uh, uh, a rather intense uh, religious education. Of course, it all vanished later on. Yeah. And something disappeared from her world. The world became nearly personal. And, and uh, the, uh, that uh, religious conception of the world was non-existent, apparently. But, you see, the idea of a deity mm -hmm. is not an intellectual idea, it is an archetype, it's an archetypal idea. Therefore, you, you find it practically everywhere under this or another name, you know, even if it has the name Mana, it is, it, 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 it is uh, an old powerful, uh, uh, extraordinary effect or uh, quality, uh, even if you're not personal at all. Uh, and so she certainly became aware of an entirely heathen uh, image yes. um, that comes fresh from the archetype. She had not the idea of a Christian God uh, or of a uh, Old Testament Yahweh. Uh, it, it was a heathenish god, you see, a, a, a god of nature, of vegetation. He was the wheat himself, he was the spirit of the wheat, uh, uh, the spirit of the wind. And she was in the arms of that human. No. Now, that is the living experience of an archetype. Now, that made a tremendous impression upon that girl, and instantly it clicked. She saw. What she really was missing, that missing value, that, uh, that was, was in the form of a projection in myself and made myself indispensable to her. Yeah. And then she thought, it's not indispensable, because it is, as the dream says, she is in the arms of uh, that uh, archetypal yeah. uh, idea. Now that is a luminous experience, you see. And, and that is the thing that uh, people are looking for. Yes. The, an archetypal experience that gives them uh, uh, an incorruptible value. You see, they depend upon other conditions, they depend upon desi their desires, their ambitions, uh, depend upon other people, because they have no value in themselves, they have nothing in themselves, they are only rational. And, and, and they are not in the possession of a treasure that would make them independent. But when that girl can hold that uh, experience, then she doesn't depend anymore. She cannot depend anymore because that value is in herself. And, and uh, that is a sort of liberation. Yeah. And that is, of course, uh, makes her complete, you know, uh, in as much as she can realize such a luminous experience, uh, she is able to continue her path, her way, her individuation. The acorn can become an oak uh, uh, and, and, and not a donkey. It, uh, 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 nature will take uh, uh, her course. Uh, she will become that which she is from the beginning. Now, having seen such cases, uh, quite a number of such cases, uh, that of course has given me uh, a motive to, to study the archetypes, uh, because I began to see that the structure of what I co then call the collective unconscious uh, is really uh, a sort of 
agglomeration of, uh, of such typical images uh, uh, of which each has a numinous quality, you know. The archetypes are at the same time dynamic. They are instinctual images that are not intellectually invented. Uh, they are always there and they produce certain um, processes in the unconscious uh, one could best compare with myth, myth. So that's the origin of mythology. Now, having seen such cases, uh, quite a number of such cases, uh, that of course has given me uh, a motive to, to study the archetypes uh, because I began to see that the structure of what I co then call the collective unconscious uh, is really uh, a sort of agglomeration of, uh, of such typical images uh, 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 of which each has a numinous quality, you know. The archetypes are at the same time dynamic. They are instinctual images that are not intellectually invented. Uh, they are always there and they produce certain um, processes in the unconscious uh, one could best compare with Myth, myth. So that's the origin of mythology. Mythology is a pronouncing of series of images that formulate the life of archetypes. And so the statements of every uh, religion, and of many uh, uh, poets and so on, are uh, uh, statements about the inner uh, um, mythological process, which is a necessity because man is not complete. If he is not conscious of uh, that aspect of things, so you see, a man is not complete when he lives in a world of statistical truth. He must live in a world of his biological truth, that is his biological truth, that is not uh, uh, merely statistics. It is the, the expression of what he really is, as what he feels himself. So is he somebody without the mythology is uh, merely a an, uh, an effect of statistics, as it were, is an average phenomenon. And while uh, the truth is, uh, the carriers of life are individuals, not <coughs> average numbers. Yes. <coughs> Yet uh, our natural science uh, makes everything to an average, reduces everything to an average, and of course, <coughs> all the individual qualities are wiped out. And that, of course, is, is most uh, unbecoming. It is, it is unhygienic. It deprives people of their specific values, where they are individuals. Uh, it, takes, it deprives them of the most important experiences of their life, where they experience their own values. The, <coughs> maybe the creative background of their personality. I see the trouble is that nobody understands these things apparently. Uh, it's just quite, quite strange. Do you think that the humanities mm -hmm. are important for the individual mm -hmm. who, who wants to study mm -hmm. the individual? One doesn't see what uh, uh, an education without humanities is doing to man. Yeah. He loses the connection with, uh, with, uh, with his 
Tamidas is where, that means with this, the whole stem, the, 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 the tribe, the, the connection with the past, that he lives in that in which man always has lived, man has always lived in the midst. And uh, we think we are able to be born today and to live in Nomi in without history. That, that is a, a disease that's absolutely abnormal because man is not born every day. He is once born in, in a specific historical setting with the specific historical qualities and therefore he is only complete when he has a relation to it to these things. It's just as if you were born without eyes and ears, uh, when, you are born, when you are growing up with no connection with the past. From the, natural, with the center of natural science, you need no connection with the past. You yes. can wipe it out. Yes. Yes. And that is, that is a, a, a mutilation of, of, of the human being. Now I saw uh, from a practical experience that uh, this uh, kind of proceeding uh, had a most extraordinary therapeutical effect. Um, I can uh, tell you such a case. Uh, that was a, uh, a, a young uh, Jewish uh, girl, and uh, she, uh, her father was uh, uh, a banker. And she had received the uh, entire worldly education. She had no idea of, of any, any tradition or so. And then I, uh, I went further into her history and found out that, that her grandfather had been uh, a sadic mm -hmm. in, in Galicia. And, and, uh, and when I knew that, I knew the whole story. That girl suffered from a, a phobia, a terrific phobia, and has been a, in, a, in a psychoanalytic treatment already uh, with no effect. Uh, and she was really uh, badly plagued by that uh, phobia, uh, anxiety stage of all sorts. Of. And, um, and then I saw that girl has lost the connection with the past, has lost, for instance, the fact that her grandfather was a sadic that he lived in the midst, and uh, he, her father w was out, had fallen out of it too. So I, I simply told her, uh, you, see, you will understand what your fear is. You know what you have lost. And she didn't, of course not. I said, your fear is, is the fear of your way. Mm. You know the effect was that within a week she was cured from from so many years of, of bad and bad stage. Because you see that went like a lightning for her. But uh, I only could say it because I knew that that she is absolutely lost. She, she thought she was in the middle of things, but she was lost, gone. No, made no sense. Well, what, well, what is the ex uh, our existence, you know, when we, when, when we are just average uh, numbers, you know. The more you, you make people to average numbers, the more you, uh, you, you destroy our society. Yeah. The ideal state is then a slave state, then you can uh, go to Russia, there is, there is wonderful. Uh, there you can be a number, but uh, <laughs> one pays it very nearly. Our whole life goes to, to places. Okay. Uh, and so we here had uh, plenty of cases uh, of a similar uh, kind. And that has naturally uh, led me on to a, a profound uh, study of the archetype. I right? got more and more uh, respectful of archetypes than uh, now of I know. Uh, uh, that thing should be taken into account. That is an enormous factor, very important uh, for, uh, for our further development and uh, for our well-being. Now, in... Uh, um, I, uh, it was of course t difficult to know where to begin because it is such an enormously yeah. uh, yeah. extended uh, yeah. field and 
the, the, the next uh, question I asked myself was, now where in, where in the world has anybody been busy with that problem? And I found nobody, except uh, a peculiar uh, spiritual movement uh, that uh, went uh, together with the uh, beginnings of Christianity, namely the Gnostics. Uh, uh, and uh, that was the first thing I said and that I saw. They were concerned with this, the problem of archetypes and made a peculiar philosophy of it. As ever I thought him makes a peculiar philosophy of it when he comes across it naively and doesn't know that those are structural elements of the unconscious psyche. Now they, uh, uh, they live, have lived uh, in, the, in the first, second and third century and, and what was in between? Nothing. And now, today, we certainly fall in, into that hole uh, and are confronted by the problems of the collective unconscious, which were then the same uh, in 2,000 years ago, and, uh, and we are not prepared to, to meet that problem. I was always looking for, uh, for something in between, you know, something that linked that remote part with the present moment, uh, and I found to my amazement it is alchemy that is understood to be a history of chemistry. It, it, it is, one could almost say nothing less than that. Uh, it is, it, it is uh, uh, a peculiar move, spiritual movement or philosophical movement that call themselves philosophers. Uh, like Gnosticism. And then I, I read uh, the whole accessible literature, Latin and, and Greek, uh, it because it was enormously interesting. It is the, the mental work of 1,700 years uh, in which they restored up uh, all they could make out about the nature of the archetypes. Uh, in, a, in a peculiar way, uh, that's true, it, it is not simple, um, and you know, most of the texts are, are not published, in, uh, no more published since the Middle Ages, the, 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 the last editions are in the, uh, in the middle or end of the 16th century, all in Latin, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, some texts are, are in Greek, uh, and not a few, the important ones. Now, uh, that has given me no, no end of, of work, uh, uh, but the result uh, was most satisfactory uh, because it showed me the development of our rela unconscious relations to the collective unconscious uh, and the variations uh, our consciousness has undergone. Uh, while being unconsciously concerned with these mythological images. Uh, for instance, such phenomena uh, as in uh, Hitler or, or so, you know, uh, that's an archetypical phenomena, and we've got to understand these things. Uh, it is just a show as if a terrific uh, 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 epidemic of typhoid fever they're breaking out, and we say, now this is time for a fever. Isn't that a, a marvelous disease? It can take on in all the dimensions, and nobody knows anything about it. Nobody takes care of the, uh, or, or, or of the, the, the water supply. Nobody thinks of, of examining uh, the, the meat or, or something like that. Uh, one simply states that this is a phenomenon, yes, but one doesn't understand it. And, uh, uh, and to me, of course, it was a, uh, an enormous problem because it is a factor that has determined the fate of millions of European people and of Americans. It is, uh, he, he, nobody can deny that he has been influenced by, by the war. That is all Hitler's doing, and that's all psychology. 
our foolish psychology. But you only come to an understanding of these things when you understand the background yes, yes. From, from which it springs. Yes. Uh, and so, of course, I cannot tell you in detail about, uh, the, uh, yeah. about alchemy. It is, uh, it is the, 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 the basis of our modern way of perceiving things. Uh, and, and therefore, it is as if it were right under the threshold of consciousness. Uh, uh, this is a, a wonderful picture of how uh, the development of archetypes, that means the movement of, of archetypes, uh, looks, uh, when you look upon them as if from above, maybe from today, you look back into the past and you see how the present moment has evolved out, out of the past. Uh, and and uh, it is just as, as if uh, the alchemistic philosophy, it, it, it sounds very curious, we should give it a mentality different name. It has a different name called hermetic philosophy. Of course, that conveys just as little as, as the term alchemy. Yeah. It is the parallel development as Gnosticism was to the uh, conscious development, say, of Christianity, mm. of our Christian philosophy, uh, uh, of the whole psychology of the Middle Ages. And so, you see, in our days, we have such and such a uh, view of the world, such and such a philosophy, um, but in the unconscious we have a different one. And that uh, we can see in, uh, through the example of the alchemistic philosophy that behaves towards the medieval consciousness exactly like the unconscious behaves to ourselves. And we can construct or even predict our, uh, the, the, the unconscious of our days when we know what, what it has been yesterday. Now that is, uh, in a, with a few words, uh, uh, the development uh, of my ideas. Um, I, I uh, think without going into detail, I, yes, I, yes, I couldn't uh, further yes, elaborate. Well, you have gone into great detail so elsewhere, though, unless you're writing, of course. Uh, uh, yes. Well, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> Well, people have, have to, to read the books finally, yeah, yeah, uh, right. in spite of the fact that yeah. they are, they are thick. So, and we're hoping, and we're hoping. I'm sorry.